Okay, let's uh, start by going into uh, Unreal Engine 4, I mean Unreal Engine 5. We're doing tiny game number 4. Now if you notice, I've already created a folder for tiny game 4. Uh, there's nothing in it yet, but it's because uh, we're, but I did create the repository on, let's go into simple charts on GitHub. So here's our main content. Well, that wasn't exactly the right. I wish you didn't have to click four times to get to it. There, there's our tiny game four. There's nothing in here besides just a few tests, but this is the repository. So this is where we, this is what we're gonna clone. So we start by cloning this and we go into GitHub right, I mean, uh, Git Bash here. Hey, do you like my, do you like my new window? Look, it's purple and multicolored, and it's also translucent. It's transmazing. Elder Colvey House said, "Transmazing." So get stages. See, it says it's not a. Forty-seven said, "Nice." It's not a Git repository or anything because we haven't cloned anything yet. So we have to get clone, and then we'll shift insert that. Uh, there it is. Get clone, cloning into Tiny Game 4, and now it is a good repository. Oh! Do you see what just happened here? Let's destroy what we just did. We're going to completely obliterate that folder that we just created. Okay, see, so rm-rf, I don't recommend anyone ever doing that unless they've reached the expert level systems admin. <laughs> because that you do that wrong, you know, like rm star, that's, God, that's dangerous. Okay, that removes a directory without even asking you, are you sure you want to do this? Okay, now this is where we have to remove that directory again. That's right. Device or resource busy? Oh, oh, what's what's so busy about it? It must be because we're in it. Here, let's destroy it. There. Okay, so now there's nothing there. We'll get bash right into our Unreal Projects folder. See, now we're gonna get we're gonna do the same thing. There's a bunch of ways we you know we could just go back like this and we can do it. There, get cloned. Boom. Now we go into Tiny Game 4. We will see it is now a Git repository. Git status. There it is. We've got um, your branches up to date with Origin Main. Okay, so we're ready to start version controlling what we do in Tiny Game 4. Mm. But we're not quite done. We want to copy our git ignore file. I don't, we don't need git attributes yet, uh, but we definitely are sharing this git ignore, so I keep copying this into every project. So now if we, yeah, git, git status. And untracked files already git ignore, so we're gonna check that in in just a moment. I'll show you how to check something in really quick. Uh, so we just git add that, git add star, everything that hasn't been, um, uh, staged for checked in. Get staged. Oh, but it won't. I have to very explicitly say that. There, see, now it works. Okay. Um, uh, first, first commit from local, adding uh, get ignore. Yeah, I usually be semi-explicit for each commit. You don't have to be, but it helps. Uh, the reason we're version controlling this here is because, first of all, the Git integration in Unreal 5, Engine 5, sucks. It will, don't use it. It will destroy your projects. Just don't use it. Unless you like your projects being destroyed by the very version control that's supposed to save it. I mean, I found that out really quick. Uh, and most most people, most game devs don't version control their stuff at all, which I think is a real mistake. I mean, you definitely want to version control everything you do. Um, now, there's a debate about um, 
deversion control Unreal Engine 5 projects because you know most of them are binary files that are they're already compiled. You don't you generally don't version control big compiled files. You version control code, but that's okay. It's okay. There's nothing that says you can't. And if there are any big files, we use git large file system, and that's what that git attribute is. Okay, so now I'm going to direct you to I'm going to direct you to Udemy. Uh, let's take a look at the course that we're working on. We are working on this one, and his name is David Nixon. Elder Coffee House said, Oh, Dunbrine 47, did you know this is also the same guy who showed me how to stamp and build a standalone Windows executable game? Yeah, this is actually David Nixon. He's the same one. So, you know, when I found, uh, I finally found the right video um, to learn how to stamp, you know, uh, I had to install a bunch of stuff. Like I had. So the guy who picked up the slack when the other one failed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there were there were two others that never showed us. Actually, all three of them never showed us. Like, oh, here's how you build a game. Okay, bye. Oh, great. So, so we're the only ones that are ever going to be able to play our own game because you didn't show us how to tag, bag, and ship it. Now it's like um, going to a grocery store. Then you. You know, then you pick a bunch of stuff in your cart, and then you have to eat everything there because they don't have a way to tag, bag, and ship it. Okay, so I guess I'll just have dinner in my shopping cart. All right, so uh, we are uh, here. Yeah. This is the uh, uh, course that we're doing, and um, you kind of saw, got an idea what uh, the game will look like. This is the game. So first, go to the Create menu See. and add a box trigger to the level. See, this is what we're doing. Name it Music Trigger Box. Uh, this is one of the later videos, so I don't want to... Oh, why does it go all the way back here? And then it goes to the wrong place. So now you have to go here, preview this course, go to the course. Why does it do that? Registration and installation. Okay, how far did we get the level editor? I don't know if we got all the way through here actors what is this go to course oh god why what have they done to this what have they done to this website it's, you know they're trying to do all these cute pop-up bells and dings and whistles and everything okay so let's do this uh, I don't remember where we were. I think we were doing stuff like this, right? Uh, snapping. We were learning snapping and then different ways to view your level. Uh, overview and finding content. See, there's a lot of this stuff like content browser, adding, importing, and saving the settings. Let's skip over these, okay? Because uh, I, I, do, I am going to go through his uh, tutorials here, but we don't really need to do all this because this will take a lot of time and the outliner see you know I already know most of this stuff but and this inevitably one. every video that I watch I learn some new things but um see you can see this is where it starts this is truly where the uh, the game starts and that's why you know we're actually going to start uh, building the game tonight down here so yeah we'll get through at least this entire section uh, actors and then there's blueprints players and input collisions user interfaces and audio and then additional topics in each of these sections you know this this is where you know towards the end that's where you build the game yeah so 
here we go. Static meshes. Oh, you know, I guess it would help if I opened up Unreal Engine 5 first. Unreal Engine 5. And we already have a uh, sample project that we're using as he teaches us things. Um, Unbrine 47 dumped 500 points into Messborn. You know, something else uh, interesting. Um, also, now that Stream Avatars is up, Stream Avatars is also supposed to give us notifications, and that didn't even happen. So, something weird is going on with Streamlabs at the Streamlabs level, I think. And I just don't know what it is. God, look how tiny uh, Stream Avatars is on my 4K screen. <laughs> okay, so we're. Where was that? Content examples, metahuman stuff. Oh, it doesn't show up here. Oh shit. Don't tell me it's gone. Yeah, test for Tiny Game 4. That's what. Yeah. That's it. Sonicus Streaminus said, it's raining bombs. Oh, start it's raining bombs. Here it comes. <laughs> Yeah, there's actually going to be bombs in here. Speaking of bombs, there will be bombs in this fourth game. Hmm. I don't know why I have a whole landscape, but um, I think it's just because we're in the wrong level here. Let's see. All content, started content. No. Oh, we never even we never even made a level. That's why. Okay. We never saved it, which is okay. I mean, this is just the tutorial part. All right. So, congratulations on finishing the section on the level editor. It was a long section. There was a lot of information to get through, but you did it and you're here and now you know the ins and outs of the level editor and are fully prepared to move forward. We essentially so do you've already. The basics of what an actor is and you've learned how to place them in a level and rotate and scale them and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, in this section, you'll be learning about several different types of actors and how each type can enhance your levels in cool and unique ways. You're going to learn about an actor that can be used to prototype your levels and about actors that can represent physical objects. You're going to learn about actors that can generate light, actors that can generate fog, and actors oh, that can find a volume of space. And then at the end of the section, we will start working on our tutorial game. So there's a lot of fun stuff to look forward to in this section. And for this lecture, I'm going to be discussing the static mesh actor. Finally, so the first thing you need to know is what a mesh is. A mesh is simply a 3D model yeah, of it's an coming object. Up. There are two specific <coughs> types of meshes that you can use as actors in the Unreal Engine. These are the static mesh and the skeletal mesh. So a static mesh is Telescan. a mesh that doesn't bend, deform, Telescan. or change shape in any way. A static mesh can still move around on the screen, it just can't animate. So for example, you could use a static mesh in the shape of a cube to represent a cardboard box. And you could have that box slide across a surface, or fall off a table, or fly across the room. But you couldn't have flaps that open and close. For objects with moving parts, you would use a skeletal mesh. With the skeletal mesh, you can define individual parts of the mesh and how those parts connect and move, move with one another. Mm -hmm. So static meshes for objects without moving parts and skeletal meshes Done for objects with moving parts. Nice. Now, that being said, we will mainly be focusing on static meshes for this beginner's course. So there are a few different static mesh actors in the create menu. In the shapes category, there are static meshes in the shape of... Okay, he's in, he's in this uh, test first person test so let's open it let's create a new level okay new level uh i think it's basic thank you for the follow hydro art hey yeah there see now when stream avatars is on okay when stream avatars is on it does show but we need more than that right or, you know, it's possible. I oh, thank you, thank you, Haldor Eight. Haldor. Is that like Holdor? 
Hold it or Okay, let's do basic new level. Sonicus huh. Streaminus said, Welcome Haldor. It's it's completely empty. I think we kind of screwed up here. I think we're gonna need to create a whole new project. Ben level. Yeah, but, uh, let's see if there's a starter map, minimal default. Yeah, we kind of need, it'd be nice to, to get that same here. Here, let's, let, let me think about that for a second. Uh, this sucks. So uh, we need to create a new, we need to create a whole new project. Yeah, yeah, we do, we do. Uh, so test for tiny game four. Let's just destroy that. It's gone. And now we're just going to create a brand new project so we can match what he's doing in this one. And I know which map he's in. Just hang in there. Elder Colvey House said, "Destroy project." Uh, so now we're just going to do un launch Unreal Engine 5.1. Anything we do that's new, including this Tiny Game 4, will now be in Unreal Engine 5.1. It is not a great idea to upgrade from, like, you know, your games from 5.0 to 5.1 because there's a lot of issues. Like, my gravity totally screwed up. Oh, done, Brian. I'll have to show you. in Sonic, I'll have to show you my newest levels on Tiny Game 3. It's kind of giving it away here. Um, but I don't want to show you yet. You know, we'll look at it later on. Here's the first person. Yeah. Starter content. Yes. Ray tracing. Yes. Quality presets should be scalable. Target platform. Um, uh, test for Tiny Game. What? Oh, cannot... Okay, test for tiny game four. There. And now it'll open up that project. Okay, there we go. Okay, we should be back now. Uh, just refresh. Uh, refresh. So, who had what for dinner? Just tuna salad for me. Refresh if you need. Back, Colby. Yeah, it looks like a couple of the bots are the only things that left. Um, Orink said, hello world. Oh, hey, Orink. Hope you're, hope you're doing great. Uh, yeah, we just uh, had a uh, shart, but we fixed it. I had a ring. Okay, and now we should, everything else should be ready to go. Okay. It, it didn't save, you know, it doesn't save when OBS crashes like this, uh, which is really dumb. Why doesn't OBS save everything you do? Because, you know, inevitably a stream is going to crash, right? 
I mean, it kind of assumes that the stream's never going to crash. Well, of course it does. Okay, so we're not going to put the green screen on. That may have uh, sharded. That may have been why we sharded. Uh, it's still building the shaders for uh, because we included starter content. So let's just wait a little bit on that. Um, that's bugged out. Um, but everything else should be fine, I think. Um, yeah, this is fine. We can leave that up. Uh, how is everything else running? Uh, while we're waiting for that, I think we could, yeah, we can keep listening to him. With some static meshes, for example, this furniture here. Uh -huh. And there are some architectural meshes as well. But this is a very small supply. So you will want to be importing in meshes that you download or create yourself in a 3D modeling application. And I'll show you later on in the course where you can download collections of meshes and other content for you to use in your games. Alright, so now that you have a basic understanding of what static meshes are, I'll discuss using them in the Unreal Editor. Mm -hmm. So again, like other actors, you drag static meshes into your level and position them and adjust other properties to your liking. But what if I position a mesh just where I want it and then decide I want to use a different mesh in its place? I could delete this actor, drag in a new mesh, and then do the work again to position it mm -hmm. and rotate it and so on. I know a how to do it. The better way would be to use the details panel to mm -hmm. replace the static mesh that the actor is using. So in Unreal, the static mesh itself is actually a property of the static mesh actor. So for example, if I position this chair just how I want it, and then decide I want there to be a couch here instead, I can select the chair, then go to the static mesh category of the details panel to replace the mesh being used by that actor. So one way to do that is by using this drop down menu here. So I can click on this and then find the couch mesh I want to use. And, and notice this menu contains a search box that you can use to search for the asset you want to use. So See, when I, I click on the couch, this. it will replace the chair with the couch. And the couch will have all the same properties the chair had, including position, rotation, and so on. Mm -hmm. Because technically we didn't replace the actor, we only replaced the mesh that the actor was using. Another way I could have selected the couch or any other static mesh I wanted to use would be to browse to it in the content browser, select it, and then click on this arrow here. So this arrow will replace this asset with whatever is selected in the content browser when you click it. Alright. Okay, the next thing I'm going to talk about is applying physics to your static meshes. By default, static mm. meshes have physics turned off. So if I place a cube mesh in my level, and then press play, you will see that the cube doesn't fall to the ground, it just sits there. Even if I press up against it, it won't move at all. It's like a Snorlax on Benadryl and Ginseng, okay? It's not going anywhere. Unlike these other cubes, which react to the force of the projectile, or the force of the character walking into them and pushing them. So, there's two reasons why this cube mesh isn't behaving the same way. The first reason is that its mobility is set to static. When the mobility is static, we are telling the engine that this actor will never change its position or rotation for any reason. So, the first thing we need to do is set the mobility to movable. By setting the mobility to movable, I would now be able to, for example, create a blueprint with some movement logic in it that tells the cube how to move around in the level, something you will learn how to do later in this course. But even with the mobility set to movable, this cube still won't react to force from other actors because it doesn't have physics enabled. So to do that, with the cube selected, I'm going to go to the physics category in the details panel and check the box next to simulate. Yeah, this is pretty important. Okay, it, we just it six. just popped. There we go. We just popped. So now we can essentially go to exactly where where he is, which is pretty much here. Um, see, he, uh, this is right where he is. Uh, and what he was saying is, um, um, you know, these cubes have physics enabled. Oh, will you stop doing that? Here, you can change that to start from, yeah, current camera location. See, now watch. There, see, the reason that just dropped and the reason I can push these is because they have physics enabled. Uh, here's what he was saying. So if you go in here and add a cube, here, nothing happens. Why is this? Why is it? So now he shows us how to enable physics. Like physics. So if I press play, at, at this course. But even with the mobility set to movable, this can you with some. In the mobility to move. First thing we need to do is set the mobility to movable. And I didn't know By setting that. the mobility to movable, I would now be able to, for example, create a blueprint with some movement logic in it that tells the cube how to move around in the level. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that. I didn't know you had to do that. I've actually never done that before. Wait, now I lost. Oh, 
I thought I lost my cursor, but it's because I was simulating. Okay, so you start here, uh, you change this to movable. See, there's the movable, uh, and then... Something you will learn how to do later in this course. But even with a mobility set to movable, this cube right. still won't react to force from other actors because it doesn't have physics enabled. So to do that, with the cube selected, I'm going to go to the physics category in the details panel and check the box next to simulate physics. Mark bomb. Simulate physics. Right here. Why is his a little different? Hmm. His is different. Now why is this? So if I press play, you can see that the cube now falls. Yeah, now it should fall to the ground. Here, plop. Yeah, and I can push it around. See, I can push it. To the ground. And if I push it, my force will move it along the ground. And if I fire a projectile at it, it will react to the force of the projectile. Oh, all So already. as you can see, wow. there are some other properties under the, phys under the physics category. One of them is the mass of the actor, measured in kilograms. Optics with more mass require more force applied against them in order to be affected. So if I make this cube really massive, shooting it won't move it much. Yeah, see, let me show you that. Uh, that's true. So there's your... Uh, I don't know why I don't have the things that... But I should have it, and I don't. Uh, let's see, uh, 5,000. There. Plop. And now, see, I can hardly move it at all. In fact, let's grab the gun and then shoot it. It does, it, it sort of moves, but not like these, you see. It doesn't move like, like these do. Okay. Uh, and now let's give it a mass of one and watch what it, watch how that behaves. You should be, yeah, whoa. Okay, see, it's essentially like, I don't know what you would call that, like a bubble. Watch this. Boom! It just, it's so light it just disappeared. Poof. And even if we do 10, a lot of Unreal, a lot of game development is like this trial and error, right? See, that's like still too light, but like it would go 50. Now all of a sudden, it starts to behave like the other. Yeah, like the other cubes. Boom. So that's just a mass of 50. It's almost like a like a tiny little uh, plastic, empty plastic box. Okay. But if I make it a lot less massive, it will go a lot farther with the same amount of force applied. So the next two properties are linear damping and angular damping. Mm -hmm. Damping refers to the amount of drag that is applied to the movement of the object. So similar to having more mass, the more drag an actor has, the harder it is to move. Yeah, yeah. But in this case, drag is meant to represent friction on the object. So if this cube were a smooth block of ice, it would have less drag on it than, say, a rough block of stone, even mm -hmm. if the two had the same mass. The linear damping property affects translational movement of the object, meaning a change in location, while the angular damping property affects rotational movement of the object, meaning a change in rotation. So by increasing the linear damping, when I shoot this object, it won't go as far although I can still make it spin fairly easily. But if I decrease the linear damping to a negative value, it will travel a far distance when I shoot it. But now let's say I turn the linear damping up and turn the angular damping down. When I shoot it, it won't go far, but it will rotate a lot. Okay, so below the <laughs> angular damping property is the enable gravity setting. So if I turn this off, but leave simulate physics on, the cube will still react to force, but gravity will not affect it. So if I press play, the cube will start off stationary because without the force of gravity affecting it, there are essentially no forces affecting it right now. But if I push it, it will start to move. And unless it collides with something, oh, it stops yeah, momentum, yeah, let's it will try continue that. moving. That's, that looks like fun. Okay, I, I actually haven't tried that yet. Okay, so let's make all of these enable gravity. Let's turn the gravity off on those. And then on the angular damping for this, let's uh, say negative three, actually all of them. I think we should be able to yeah, change the angular damping to negative three. Okay, now let's try it. Whoa, we're in outer space now, right? Whoa. 
<sighs> Bonk. Boom. <laughs> yeah, goodbye. That's funny. And then I get a poop. Oh, this, hmm, for some reason that didn't seem, oh nice. yes it did. Whee! Goodbye. Yeah, cute. So this can replicate zero gravity environments like being in space. Mm -hmm. Below the enable gravity property are the constraint properties. These allow you to prevent translational or rotational m movement in specified directions when the mesh is affected by physics. So one way to do this is this to is use what the lock position and breakers. lock rotation properties to lock the movement of one or more of the three main axes. You can use the mode property to select from some presets or to define a custom plane that doesn't run directly it. parallel That's to exactly one of the three main axes. For, for example, if I place this cube in the air, when I press play, it will fall to the ground. But if I lock the position of the mesh along the z-axis and then press play, it will be unable to change its z-location even though there is a downward force being applied to it. And then these two properties up here allow you to ignore radial impulses or forces that would otherwise affect the mesh. Radial means rotational. So for example, let's say you're simulating a game of pool. If you were to select the 8 ball and check ignore radial force, and then you simula simulated the game and put some backspin on the cue ball, when it collided with the 8 ball, the backspin wouldn't have any effect. Only the translational movement of the cue ball would affect the 8 ball. Alright, and then the next property determines if damage to the mesh should cause a physics impulse to be applied to it. The damage system will be covered later in the course. Alright, and then the final property here is replicate physics to autonomous proxy. This is used in multiplayer games and mark, should be checked yeah. if the server is in, charge, uh, is in charge of keeping everything in sync and unchecked if the clients are responsible. And that will conclude the lecture on static meshes. Okay. And then next is brushes. This, this will take a little while to get through. In this through. lecture, I'm going to discuss geometry brushes. In the world of 3D modeling, a brush is simply a 3D area of space. So mm. this is nearly identical to our understanding of what a mesh is, but there are several key differences between brushes and meshes. First off, brushes are used for more basic shapes. So in the Place Actors panel, in the Geometry category, you can see the brushes we have available. Mm -hmm. Some basic geometric shapes and some brushes in the shape of stairs. Now in the Shapes category, we also have some static meshes available in the form of basic geometric shapes, but as we saw in the previous lecture, meshes can be much more complex than this. In our starter content, we saw some meshes that had been created in a 3D modeling program to take the shape of a chair, and another in the shape of a table. Okay, so that's the first key difference between brushes and meshes. Meshes can be much more complex and detailed than brushes. Mm -hmm. The second key difference is in how the Unreal Engine handles brushes and meshes in memory. For example, let's say I have this brush actor here, and I make several copies of it. Each copy I make gets stored in memory, and thus each copy I make of it increases hey the memory demands of my game. However, if I have this mesh here, and I make copies of it, no matter how many copies I make, I'm not increasing the memory needed at all. That's because a single mesh only gets stored in memory once, no matter how many instances there are of it in your level. So that's the second difference. Meshes are better performance-wise than brushes. Okay, so now you may be wondering, if meshes look better, and they perform better, what use do brushes have? The answer is that brushes are better suited for making a prototype, or a rough draft of your level. While the final version of most games will have very little or no brushes in it at all, chances are each of its levels started out made almost exclusively as brushes. So you can use brushes to sculpt the basic layout of your level, and then replace those brushes with meshes once the layout is finalized. This is useful because it's easier to make changes on the simpler brushes than it is the more complex meshes. So in theory, once you have the basic layout sculpted in brushes, you won't need to keep making minor changes over and over to the more difficult to edit meshes. Okay, so that is what brushes are used for. Now let me show you how to use them. And specifically, I'll be showing you the different properties available for you to edit under the brush settings category of the details panel. Alright, so some of these properties are different depending on the oh, hey. shape of the actor, but one property that is common to all the brushes is the brush type. The brush type for any brush can either be additive or subtractive. So the additive type is pretty straightforward. An additive brush will add geometry to the level. A subtractive brush, on the other hand, will subtract from existing geometry in the level. So if I have this additive box brush here, and I drag in, say, a cylinder brush, and make it subtractive, and then I overlap the two actors, Wherever the subtractive cylinder brush is overlapping, it's causing oh, the geometry that. that was there to be removed. Mm -hmm. You can think of subtractive brushes as holes in the shape of the brush. 
Now, this feature is one of the main reasons why brushes are so well suited to sculpting overall level design. By adding and subtracting geometry in this way, you can sculpt the layout of a level much faster than you could trying to use meshes. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next property under brush settings is brush shape. So this just means, is it a box, is it a cone, is it a cylinder, and so Okay, well let's try that. Yeah, I did not I did not know that about geometry. You can make it uh, subtractive. Okay, so um, the, the geometry, but now where are those? Uh, let's go back and find out where he grabbed those. Sonicus Streaminus said, hey madam. Uh, We're building tiny game for now. Um, let's see. Where did he select that? How did he get this place actors? Boy, I must have missed it. Oh, I really missed it. There, I'm going to discuss geometry brushes. In the world of 3D modeling, a brush is simply a 3D area of space. Yeah, but where is it? Place actors. Oh, there it is. So you have to, it's in one of these windows. There it is, place actors. There it is. Okay, cinematic visual effects geometry. And these are brushes. So if we do, if we put a box here, uh, and then we'll say cone here. Whee, cone. But now watch this. At any time, you can change how many there how many sides the cone has see that see now it's a now it's a pyramid you can change the the z see like hello. now it's like the luxor uh, and then i can turn it into a can turn it into a re resource hog see and, and then I can press end, yeah, and that should plop it down to there. But I don't think you can apply physics to it. As far as I know, you can't. Yeah, see, look, 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 you can't apply physics. That's not what it is. And then, just like he said, now let's try uh, putting a cylinder in DeWild. And then let's give it a bunch of sides like, oh, like 42. And then we'll make it big, but then fairly, oh, let's say 0 0.3. Uh, and then the Z can be like that. 0 0.5, okay. And then we're going to rotate it. You know, there's the rotate arm here. And then, okay, now we're going to ram it into that thing. Like you said, we're going to ram it in here. Let's ram it. Oh, it doesn't want to ram it. Okay, let's, there we go. See, now we literally rammed it in. And now we're going to change it to subtractive. Poof, see, now there's a hole. There's a hole in there. Hello? That's pretty cool, huh? And then if I wanted to, I could see now, if you wonder where it went, well, it's in here. So there's the cylinder brush, see, and then we can duplicate it. Put it there, put it down there. And yeah, see, you can go apeshit with those. That's kind of a you know, easy way to just uh, sculpt things really quickly. And then, you know, the, the spear is where that would get really useful too. Uh, you know, you can remove parts of things with a with the spear. Uh, actually, here, I could just do this. Now watch. And then... Uh, I'll move that up to the top and then subtract it. And then we can stop playing and farting around and get to business. Never figured out how to grab. 
yeah there's a way to like move things around properly and it's in one of his earlier videos like he shows you all kinds of good tricks yeah see something like this okay so now you make that subtractive you can change look you can also change it to this anytime there oh shit there oh shit it's still messed up see I don't know what I'm doing. There we go. No, th there we don't go. That's still not what I wanted. So let's make this bigger. There, see, that's kind of more like what I was looking for. See, you can do anything you want. But you, you can't simulate physics. Oh, you can simulate physics. I was not aware of that. No, you cannot. No, you can't, see? Because why would you be able to simulate physics because these cylinders are sticking out. See, they're literally sticking out in space. So it, it would be a different object. It would just look completely different if you actually did, see? Yeah, there's no option there for that reason. However, there is in these, see, simulate physics. This is the one that we created. Whoops. Ah. Bonk. Okay, so there we go. Space. So this is nearly identical to our understanding of what a mesh is, but there are several key differences. Oh, whoops, here. For example, a box brush will yeah, have that's where we I will talk about in the lecture on materials. So the box brush has these X, Y, and Z properties, mm -hmm. but the cylinder and cone brushes have their size determined by just a Z length mm -hmm. and, an outer and, and an outer radius property. So the Z is how tall the cone or cylinder is, and the outer radius is how wide around it is. And there's and the size the cone, we just messed the radius up as measured we the messed around with. And for the sphere brush, radius is the only property used to determine its size. Okay, so the cone and cylinder brushes have a property called sides. So you might have noticed already with these brush shapes that their curved angles, so to speak, their, their curved edges, so to speak, aren't actually curves, but made up of a series of flat sides. Mm -hmm. so, these side, so the sides property determines how many of these flat sides the brush has. Mm -hmm. The more sides it has, the smoother around it will appear. The sphere brush has a, property, has a property similar to this, which is the tessellation factor. The higher this number is, the more sides the sphere will have, and the smoother it will appear. The cone and cylinder brushes also have this property aligned to side. And all this means is, if this is checked, it will align the sides of the brush with the grid. So you can see that with that checked, this side of my cone here is perfectly parallel to the grid lines. But if this is unchecked, it won't necessarily align with the grid. Okay, so another property of brushes that is common to the box, cone, and cylinder brush is whether or not the brush is hollow. So this is just what it sounds like. If this property is checked, instead of the brush being solid all the way through, it will be hollow inside, mm -hmm. and the brush will essentially be a shell with walls of some thickness. For box brushes, this is set with the wall thickness property. For cylinder ah. brushes, All this is set by the inner radius property. So the inner radius is the radius of the hollow part. For cone brushes, this is set by both the inner radius property and the cap Z property. The cap Z property determines how tall the hollow area is within the cone. But for each of these, you'll notice the property is grayed out unless the hollow property is yeah, checked. Unless hollow. And this makes sense because there will only be a wall Oh, I didn't know radius. that. Okay, let's just uh, experiment with that for a second. Okay, so uh, there's our cone in. Uh, now, let's, uh, let's make the cone hollow. Oh, look at all that stuff. Wow. What is all this stuff? Huh. Pans U texture coordinate. Oh yeah, I see. You can like um, apply different UVs to it as well. Okay. Um, surface geometry. Select. Alignment. Brush component. No, it's gone. Okay, cone brush and then sphere brush. See, like the sphere is here. Okay, but what is the issue here? Uh, what, what's the issue with the cone? Okay, there's our cone brush right there. Their outer radius. Okay, now if I say hollow, now look, there's there's nothing. But then there's the inner radius. You see how it changes? Watch this. 199, 
I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, so the outer radius, the cap Z. Oh, I see. Interesting. Cap Z changes things. How weird. Yeah, that's definitely wrong though. Oh, 195. Okay. See, so then if you change that to like 195 or let's say 6 in a radius. This isn't working like I thought it would though. Cap Z. Oh, there you go. There you go. Now it's working just like I would expect. There, there, that's what I was looking for. See, now it's hollow. Whee, hollow. That's what I was looking for. So you just, see, you just have to learn by trial and error. Okay. Better out if the object is hollow. So one thing the hollow feature is particularly useful for is for creating, <laughs> for creating rooms or buildings. So I'm gonna take this box brush here and I'm gonna scale it up a bit. And then I'm going to make it as hollow as a corrupt politician's promise. Now I'll reduce the wall thickness a bit. And now I can use another box brush, make it into the shape of a doorway, Elder House make it subtractive, his jokes fall flat so and now I can use it to create a doorway in my, in, into my hollow cube. Mm -hmm. So now oh I have yeah, a hollow let's do that. So, <laughs> Okay, let's. Uh, we don't have enough room to do that in here, so let's uh, flap and furts. Let's flip and flap and over. Let's make bring this way over here. I don't care if there's no wall on the other side. Yeah, I just need some room here, and then we're gonna um, make this whoosh, there. There we go. Now we got room. Oh my God, no! It's Here, I have to start here, and then let's make sure we have a stable platform. Yeah, okay, let's make it right there. Okay, let's do exactly what he just did. So we're gonna create a room. Starting with the box. Seven said, hey. Okay, so we'll make this, uh, uh, how about 10? Hey, oh, hey, Mr. Milkman. How's it going, Mr. Milk? I'm in. And then we're just learning how to make a room really quick. He's just kind of showing us some really basic stuff. So here's here's our room. Hey. Actually, and then now we can turn off the scale, and the Z is going to be two. See? No, actually four. Three. Yeah, yeah. Now I like that. Okay. There. Three. Three and there. Okay, now but we can say, hey, we, we need to make this hollow. So why doesn't it let me... Where is it? Beth Shadow Killer said, hi, Colvay House. Hey, hey, Beth. Sorry, I'm late. Hey, Beth. Oh, it's okay. No worries. That's weird. If I, if I click it up here, then I get it. Okay, so we're going to make it hollow. And then... Um, we have to know how much the wall thickness is so we have to go in here i was about yeah to see whoosh uh, let's actually make it the wall thickness is only going to be like one yeah yeah so now it's a hollow okay now we're going to plop another one in there plop 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 this is it's okay milk mister and hi, Beth. Elder Colvey House said, "It's okay, at Mr. Milchman. Hi, Beth." I hope Beth. everyone's having a great Exclamation night. Okay, uh, what we're doing? We're just uh, following his tutorial, and I didn't know this. See, this I makes bet. it really, really easy to prototype levels. I'm going to be using all these tricks. See why I like this guy already? He's just giving us so much. We haven't even started making the game yet, and we're we're learning so many useful things. There's our there's our house. Well, I'll be darned. It's a real house. Happy I mean, it's boring, but 
look at that and then also chopped out the see it did exactly what we wanted it to do um, when it said uh, you know the wall size or the wall length or wall width or what did it say thickness that includes the floor that's so nice. that's why you see that yesterday so had a bunch of friendly stuff oh your slava was yesterday ah nice hope you enjoyed festivities <laughs> I'm typing when I'm talking. Oh, nice. I mean, I'm talking when I'm typing. Festivities. Okay, so back to let's. I'm gonna have more fun with that. Off and it was a lot faster to build than if I had to try to make it out of separate pieces. Okay, I so see now I'm going why. to move on to these stair shaped brushes, which I wanted to discuss on their own since they have their own unique properties. So starting with the linear stair, which is the simplest of the three, you have step length, height, and width properties. Mm -hmm. So the length will affect the size of each step in this direction. Oh. The height will affect it in this direction. Oh. And the width will affect it in this direction. Oh, I see. All right, and then you can choose the number of steps for the staircase. The default is 10, but you can make this larger or smaller if you wish. Ooh, I can't wait to the try that. Okay, I didn't haven't tried that yet either. Linear staircase. Okay, linear staircase. Oh, how about here? I see. And the number of steps. We you can go you can go farther if you want. Yeah, you know, we could say a hundred. To launch Shardy stream next year. Hello, Vink and the hand There's only the like a. Amazon you're definitely going to catch your Starfield launch. Oh yeah, we'll be doing a lot of Starfield. Oh yeah, we'll be doing a lot of Starfield. I was afraid the. Which speaker would say sharp field? Okay, uh, I don't know why there's a limit there. Here, let's do this. We see, and then the step height. We and then the step length. We here, let's try. Oh, that's in the way now. Here, look. And we just destroy that. Try it out. Starfield stream's gonna be awesome. Yeah, can't wait for those. Oh, uh, I. I'll have at least a thirty ninety. I'm just not. I'm just not sure. But maybe four thousand ninety two. It's working. Hey, where's the? Oh, there's our level. Ah. Okay, so now we know how to make stairs, and we know how to make. Prototypes. And the first step property is essentially a step height property for the first step only. Add so while the step. step height property increases or decreases the height of all the steps, mm -hmm. the add the first step property will only affect the height of the first step. All right, moving on to the curved stair. The curved stair has some of the same properties as the linear stair, only such as step height, steps. step width, number of steps, and add the first step. Mm -hmm. But it also has some other properties as well that pertains to its curve. But but why did they give you these? It doesn't seem like they've given you enough um, brushes. These are brushes. Uh, okay, now he's talking about curved stairs. Uh, this is kind of cool. Okay, angle of curve. Look, you can change the angle. You can change the number of steps, but why can you go all the way up to 100 with these? Okay, and then the step said, width. Uh, you finally got enough steps of knowledge to make stairs. Step height. Step height. Okay, that's that looks dangerous. Uh, step width. Number of steps. Add the first steps. step. Inner radius. Stairs. <laughs> yeah, curve stairs. We got curve stairs. Well, it's working, but it's it's not exactly what I intended. Um, uh, see, and this is what you do. You just keep. Sharding and farting uh, with the with the engine. Step height. At Mr. Milk. I know what you have to do. Now. I know what you have to do. Okay, step width. Okay, now you have to just scale it up. There. Yeah, like that. But it's it's weird that the widget is way over here and the stairs are now way over there he'll show us a better way to do it i clearly am not doing this properly but i learned this from him now i can take the widget and then move it over 
then I can there see there's our staircase look at that it's starting to look like an actual level it's curve amazing oh we can even jump up on top of our house now okay funny it chose this oh and by the way um, I think this also has a static mesh doesn't it I mean doesn't it have a surface yes so we can add any surface we like we could add um, chrome where's chrome oh here let's do ground moss there oh no I just added it to that one stair curved stair brush Oh, you cannot add. That's interesting. Let's see what he says about that. The first of these properties is the inner radius. So you can imagine the curved stair as wrapping around an invisible column. Mm -hmm. And when the curved stair is selected, you will see the transform tool at the center of this invisible column. Mm -hmm. So the inner radius property sets the length between the center of this invisible column and the edge of the staircase. So you can see what happens to the staircase when I increase or decrease this property. Next, we have the angle of curve property. This will set the angle that is made between the two vectors pointing from the center of the imaginary column to each Houser. end of the staircase. So the default is 90 degrees, and you can easily see this because our, x, because our x and y axis vectors here, which are at a 90 degree angle, are each pointing directly at one end of the staircase. But let's say I now increase the angle of curve. Mm -hmm. You will see that the new angle you will see that the new angle created, which would be between this vector here and a vector going in this direction, is now in obtuse. I just wish we had a lot more brushes than just these. There's only literally seven brushes. This angle, or greater than 90 degrees. Or if I decrease the angle of curve below 90 degrees, you can see that an acute angle is formed. Okay, and lastly is the counterclockwise property. This one is pretty straightforward. With this unchecked, our staircase will curve in a clockwise direction. And with it checked, the staircase will instead curve in a counterclockwise direction. Okay, so the final staircase is the spiral stair. And the first property I want to discuss on the spiral stair is the step height property. Well, the step height that. property is a little different on the spiral stair than it is on the other two stairs. Mm -hmm. With the spiral stair, the step height won't affect how tall each step is. It will affect it will affect how much each step overlaps slope the step above and below. And so you can see lower. at the default value, each step overlaps its adjacent steps by about 50%. Mm -hmm. If I increase this value, the amount of overlap will begin oh. to decrease. And if it Let's try that. Okay, and now we're going to do a spiral staircase. Um, get out of there. What are you doing here? Oh, whoops. I just I just ate one-fourth of the cheese wedge. Well, we'll leave the cheese wedge there. Okay, now we'll do a spiral staircase. Now that looks like fun. It doesn't even look like I can fit under there, though. Oh, I can. Let's see. Whee! Okay. Yeah, now let's uh, um, augment it. Okay, so uh, into the spiral staircase we go, but you have to click. For some reason, you have to click it up here. Okay, so inner radius. Oh, yeah, yeah. See? Gives you a little more wiggle room, see? Inner radius, step width. Sure. Step height. This is what he was talking about, see? You can, we can still climb up it, and then step thickness. Mmm, I see. Yeah, step thickness. Number uh, number of steps per 360. Mm -hmm. That's how many steps per complete revolution, see? Like that. Whoa. There. It's 360, and then the number of steps itself will... There, we just made a stairway to heaven. Uh, okay, let's try it out. That looks fun. Whee! Well, this is fun. Oh, and look, see, there's gaps in between the stairs now because our stair thickness is less than the height difference between each stair. That's the only reason it did that. Dungreen 47 said, nice. And I think we're at the top now. And then there's the top. Whee! Ah! Oh my god, it's over. Ah! Plop. We can't die in this test chamber. <laughs> well, this does feel like a test chamber, doesn't it? Okay, so there's that. 
eventually the steps will no longer overlap and begin to have some distance from each other. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make each step actually be taller, you would increase the step thickness property to achieve that. All right, so the spiral staircase has a numb step has a numb step property like the other two, but it also has a numb steps per 360 property. So this defines the number of steps in one full spiral of the staircase. So right oh, now we have 16 steps said. per the spiral and we say that our staircase system. should have 16 steps total. Agreed. So therefore this staircase will currently have just one full spiral. Mm -hmm. But if I double the amount of total steps to 32, with the num steps per 360 still set at 16, I will now have two full spirals of the staircase. Mm -hmm. And if I now increase the num steps per 360 to 32, I will again have just one full spiral, but now with 32 steps instead of 16. All right, so the next property is the sloped ceiling property. With this unchecked, the underside of the staircase will just resemble upside down stairs. But if I check this, it will make the underside completely smooth. Oh, didn't know that. Okay, so uh, he said sloped ceiling and then the sloped floor makes everything, look, it makes the whole thing smooth. Well, well, uh, is 150. Nope, it only lets you go up to 100. But you could just duplicate this and then just keep going up. Uh, you know what else you could do then? You could... Here, let's let's take one of these. Exclamation mark bomb. Turn it into a sphere. Yeah, shape sphere. You know what we're going to do with this? Oh my god, what have I done? Nope, okay. Uh, change this into a sphere. Okay, and then plop. Why does it? Why does it do that? Oh, because they're all like that. Okay. Okay, spear. I don't know what happened back there, but let's just pretend like. There we go, that's what I wanted. I want this over here. There. And you see what I'm gonna do here? I'm gonna, wee. There's a better way to do this here. I just press uh, this sphere uh, and then I'll say uh, 2000, there and actually more like 3,000. Okay, now let's roll. It won't work, but I think it'd be funny to see what it does just for the hell of it. Okay, look, God rays. It's see, we've got God rays. Punk, oh my God, but then I fall down. Where's the ball? Oh, there it is. It fell in. No! What happened? What happened to our... Elder Colvey House said, something completely took a bite out of our house. I don't know who took a big somebody must have really been hungry let's see what what we did that made that happen yeah move elements move elements good. move it was that whatever that was just then redo clicking on actors and then redo sloped ceiling sloped floor Oh, nice flavor. there are other brushes that we don't even see. That's why. That's not a good design. That's not a good uh, engine design because th that causes things that you wouldn't expect. Not a good idea. And then with the sloped floor property, I can change the top surface of the staircase to be perfectly smooth. Mm -hmm. So I have now, in essence, changed this from a staircase into a curved ramp. Okay, so that will do it for this lecture on geometry brushes. <laughs> okay, materials is next. In this lecture, I'm going to be discussing materials. 
And note that while this section of the course is focusing on the different actor types, that materials aren't actors themselves. They are simply an important property of mesh and brush actors, which is why they are being discussed here. Okay, so a material in the Unreal Engine is an asset that you can apply to the surface of a brush or mesh to make that surface, and thus the geometry behind that surface, we'll look like it's made out of a certain substance. So for example, I could resize this box brush here and use it as a wall. And then if I apply a wood material to the wall, mm -hmm. it now looks like a wooden wall. Or if I apply a brick material to the wall, it will look like a brick wall. And as you can see, to a Well, he did that way too easily. Okay, so box. I think he just used a box, right? Yeah. And then he this is what he essentially did. He just did this <clears throat> and then uh, made it a lot thinner. And then it looks more like a wall now. And then if you take uh, and then if you find the, um, there that is again, you have to, oh, oh, we do have access to the surface material if you click directly on it. Okay, um, marble. That, now it's a marble wall. And if we switch to wood, so if we switch to wood, now it's a wooden wall, but it doesn't look very good, does it? See, it looks all mungy, but his doesn't. Why, why doesn't it? So let's see brick. Let's see what, yeah. No, see, it's all munged. It's all munged up. So how did he do that? To make that surface, and thus the geometry behind that surface, look like it's made out of a certain substance. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I could resize this box brush here and use it as a wall. Oh, that's what he did. Then, okay. Okay, you have to use XYZ. And then it will remember the UV dimensions. Okay, that's what you have to do. See? So now if we do... And then... And then we'll make it a lot thinner. Not that it matters, but... Okay, and then we'll apply, let's see how he does that. And if I apply a wood material to the wall, it now looks like a wooden wall. Or if I apply a brick material. He kind of did this. He, he cheated. And use it as a wall. Mm -hmm. And then if I let's apply a wood material that. to the wall, it now looks like a wooden wall. Or if I apply a... How did he do that? He clicked on it. Oh, see, now it, now it does look good. The, the light isn't exactly here. Here, if we do this, you might be able to see it a little bit better. There we go, now you can see it's kind of like the wood. And then brick, see how he did it. He did brick, kind of like dragged it directly into it. But how is that? Oh yeah, because the scale is still the same. We've changed the brush itself. If we change the scale, if we change the scale, then of course it's going to screw up. See? See what it does? It's because we were changing the scale. You kind of have to use the, uh, you know, the brush attributes that they give you to make this happen. That's how, that's how it happened. Here's the brush component. Brush physics, box brush. Rush, click that, and then, yeah, see, brick clay old. Okay, but then if I, now I can change it here, and it should work just fine. So let's do, uh, let's do wood oak. That doesn't look, doesn't look quite right. Now, if I do the same thing, wood, oak, mm, wood, oak, does that change? Oh, no, that is, that is the wood, oak texture. Okay. Okay, well, that's good to know. A brick material to the wall, 
it will look like a brick wall. Okay. And as you can see, to apply a material to a surface, all you need to do is select the material in the content browser and drag it into the viewport and onto the surface you wish to apply it to. If you want a material to be applied to all the surfaces of a brush, one way to do this is to select the material first, and with that material selected in the content Elder browser, Calde drag the brush actor into the level, and it will get created with that material applied to all the surfaces of the brush. If you want to apply material to all the surfaces of a brush that already exist in your level, you can do the following. With the brush selected, look for the Geometry category in the Details panel. If you don't see it, make sure you have an individual surface selected by left clicking, by left clicking on a surface of the brush. Mm -hmm. So now, in the Geometry category, click on Select, and then, and then select all adjacent surfaces. Or use the shortcut Shift-J, and now all the surfaces of the brush will be selected. So now, if I drag material onto the brush, it will apply that material to all the surfaces. So in addition to dragging and dropping, another way you can apply material to a surface is to use the Surface Materials category of the Details panel. So this works just like replacing the static mesh it did in the earlier lecture. I can use, the, I can use this drop down box to select the material I want to use, or I can select the material I want to use in the content browser and then click on this arrow here to apply it. Or if I want to find the material that is currently applied in the content oh, browser, right. That's I can another click on the material class to go straight to it. Alright, so now something you should be aware of regarding materials and static meshes is a single mesh might have the ability to have different materials applied to different parts of it, as this object here does. When a mesh gets created in a 3D modeling program, such as Maya or 3D Studio Max, if it has different materials applied to different parts of its surface, once that material gets imported into the Unreal Editor, each of those sections of surface become known as elements, and you will have the ability to apply a different material to each element. Mm -hmm. So if I drag material onto this object through the viewport, the material will only be applied to the specific element it was dragged onto. And then you can see in the details panel, in the materials category, there are two elements here, and you can set them each individually. Alright, so now textures. I'm not going to go into too much detail about textures in this beginner's course, but just know that textures are what materials are made of. So a material is made up of one or more textures, and each texture is just an image file that defines one of the properties of the material. So one texture might be the actual colors of the material, while another texture maps its smoothness, smoothness or roughness and so on. So then this, da this data is combined to form the composite material. And so this drop down here will show you the textures that make up the currently applied material, and if you select one, it will take you to that texture in the content browser. Alright, so moving on. When the surface of a brush is selected, there will be a surface properties category in the details panel. The first thing in the surface properties category is a section where you can pan the material across the surface of the object. So you can use this first row of buttons here to pan the material along its U-axis. Alright, so note that a material uses the letters U and V for its axes instead of X and Y. Okay, and so the different values here represent how much to pan with each click. Or using the last column here, I could enter a custom amount. So as I click one of these buttons here, you can see the material moving across the surface in this direction. The second row of buttons is used to pan the material along the V axis. So if I click on one of these buttons, the material will now move in this direction. Okay, so there's also a section where I can rotate the material relative to the surface it's on. So if I click on this icon here, I can toggle which direction the material will rotate, either clockwise or counterclockwise, and then there are buttons to rotate it 45 degrees, 90, 90 degrees, or a custom amount. So you can see, if I click, say, 90 degrees, the material gets turned on its side, so to speak. And then over here, I have the option to flip the material, either along the U-axis or the V-axis. Alright, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is material scaling, or mm -hmm. what happens to a material when you oh, resize yeah, the is. actor that it's applied to. So when you scale an actor, the material that is applied to it will get scaled as well, as well, meaning it will get stretched or compressed. Even if I scale the actor first, and then apply the material, the effect will be the same. With static meshes, there's no way around this. Brushes, however, are a bit more flexible. If the material on one of my brush surfaces gets scaled, I can see it right here in the details panel in the scale section of the surface properties category. So as this brush is scaled larger, the bricks and the material are getting larger as well. But if I wanted instead for the bricks to be the same size they were, but for there to be more of them, I just need to set the scale back to a 1-1 ratio, and then click the apply button. And as you can see, that did the trick. So another thing about brushes is that you can edit the dimensions directly instead of having to rely on scaling. And when you change the size of the brush in this way, it doesn't change the scale ratio of the material. Mm -hmm. So if I use the X, Y, and Z properties of the brush under the brush settings category to change the size of the brush, no matter what size I make the brush, the individual bricks of this material remain the same size. Alright, so that will conclude the lecture on materials. Okay, good. Lights are next. In this lecture, I'm going to be discussing lights. In Unreal Engine, a light is simply an actor that will generate light for your level. 
So one thing you should know about lights in the Unreal Engine is that they are not meant to represent the object producing the light, only the, only the light itself. So you don't use a light actor to represent, say, a lamp or a flashlight. Mm -hmm. You would use a mesh for the lamp or flashlight, and then use a light actor to produce the light itself. Yeah, I knew All right, that. So there are five, five types of light actors in Unreal. The first of these is the directional light actor. The directional light actor is used to emulate light coming from an extremely long distance away, such as outer space. All the light will hit the level at the same angle, meaning all shadows produced by this light will be parallel. So this actor is used primarily for sunlight and moonlight. Next is the point light. The point light will produce light that emanates in all directions. This is useful for mimicking the light coming from a light bulb or fire, for example. Mm -hmm. The spotlight, on the other hand, will emit light in the shape of a cone. So this is like the light coming from a flashlight, or as the name suggests, a spotlight, like they use at the theater. The rect light, or rectangular light, projects light out of a rectangular plane. Mm -hmm. So this is useful for representing any light sources that are rectangular in shape, such as televisions, monitors, smartphones, overhead lighting, etc. The skylight actor is used to emulate the light that gets reflected off of the atmosphere and other distant objects. So when light comes from the sun or moon, a lot of it comes through as direct sunlight or moonlight, and that's what the directional light actor that we talked about earlier represents. Right. But some of that sunlight or moonlight hits particles in the atmosphere or clouds or distant mountaintops and then gets reflected off of those objects at a different angle. So the skylight actor represents that light that gets scattered in the atmosphere or reflected off of other objects and that comes through as weaker indirect sunlight or moonlight at all different angles. In simpler terms, you could say it represents the faint glow of the atmosphere. Alright, so now I want to go over the mobility setting of a light actor. I briefly covered this property earlier in the static meshes lecture, but there are additional things to take into consideration when dealing with lights. If a light is static, that means that not only can it not move, it can't change color or brightness or any other property while the game is running. If a light is stationary, it still can't move, but it can change its color, brightness, or other properties during the game. If a light is movable, it can move and change its other properties during the game. So as you move to the right along these three settings, they get more flexible in terms of what the light can do, but they also demand more resources from the processor. All right. The static setting produces static lighting, which means all of its calculations can be processed before the game runs, which is why it requires so little processing power during runtime. The stationary and movable settings produce dynamic lighting, which means calculations must be performed during runtime. Mm -hmm. Alright, so now one of the major changes in Unreal Engine 5 is that it uses a new lighting system called Lumen. The advantages of Lumen are that it can render dynamic lighting more realistically and using less processing power than was previously possible. Right. One small drawback to Lumen, however, is that it doesn't support static lighting. So by default, any light from light actors whose mobility is set to static will be ignored once that light has been processed and the game is running. So the new recommendation for Unreal Engine 5 is to set all of your lights to movable by default. Alright, so while Lumen greatly reduces the cost of using dynamic lighting, there may still be some situations where you want to use static lighting. So I'll briefly cover how that works. So first, I need to go to Edit, Project Settings, and then to the Engine Rendering page. Mm -hmm. And then if I scroll down, there will be this Dynamic Global Illumination Method property. So I'm going to change this from Lumen to one of the older methods, such as Screen Space. Note, however, that if you're wanting to use static lighting, there is a better way to do this. This will disable Lumen for the entire project, but in the lecture on volumes, I'll show you a way that you can use static lighting just in certain places while still using Lumen for the rest of the project. Okay, but for now, I'm just going to use this method. So now, I'm going to go back to the level editor and delete this skylight, and then I'm going to add a point light and set its mobility to static. And now I'm going to run the game. Mm -hmm. And you can see I get this red warning message saying lighting needs to be rebuilt. So as I mentioned before, static lighting is processed before the game runs. Uh -huh. This process is known as building the lighting. So building the lighting is easy. All you have to do is go up to the build menu and select build lighting only. Mm -hmm. And the reason the editor has you do this manually is because when you start to have many actors and or lights in your level, the build can take quite a while to perform. So even if it only took 10 seconds, you wouldn't want to have to wait those 10 seconds every time you moved an actor in your level. So this allows you to build only when you're ready. Okay, so then after the build finishes, if I press play, the baked in static lighting will render correctly, and I will no longer see the red warning message. All right, so that's how static. Okay, let's just see how that works. Uh, I haven't done that yet either. Um, we have to turn these other lights off though. So let's uh, create a new point light. Lights, point light. There's our light. But it shouldn't be doing that. I did wait, did I accidentally say spotlight? Green 47 said, bomb. 
Oh, I accidentally chose a uh, spotlight. I didn't want that. I wanted a point light. Yeah, there we go. Okay, good. Okay, now we're going to turn off all the other lights. Let this be your light. When all other lights go out. There's our lighting. Uh, we don't want the skylight now. We don't want the directional light. There we go. Ooh, now it's nighttime. See what we're doing? We're creating spooky levels now. Ooh. Okay. And making sheets I eat. Let it be darkness. All right. <laughs> your point light well, where's our freaking point light now oh there it is point light and um, the intensity there you can change the intensity uh, attenuation radius okay source radius I don't know what, why you would need that source length I don't know what any of this stuff does cast shadows yes affects the world well yeah I would hope so uh, now if we put a uh, let's put a cone here plunk uh, you see what it's doing it's uh, casting a shadow uh, let's get the whoops wrong wrong object let's get the there we go you can see it casting shadows okay good uh, the okay uh, lighting works just keep in mind that by default you'll be working with lumen oh yeah so notice how it's set to stationary uh, but if we set it to static okay now watch this uh -huh. uh, oh we'd actually have to yeah see so even though we turn it we're hiding it it's actually still visible in the game so uh, to truly turn those off Oh, where's our lighting? God dang it, I hate that. Uh, yeah, directional light. Uh, and then use temperature affects world. No. There. And then skylight. Oh. Now let's leave the skylight on. There. See, now we have our truly... That's our level. Whoa. Okay. In, and so you want to set your lights to movable. 126 said, "That's pretty cool." But we didn't get we didn't get the same uh, barking. It didn't bark at us. Like I think I think if we move it, then it will say it has to be rebuilt. No, it didn't. I don't know why it's not doing that for us. Why did, why did he get it? In your level, the build can take quite a while to perform. Mm -hmm. So even if it only took 10 seconds... Okay, so why... Okay, but for now, I'm just going to... to have, to have no, we'll deal with that later. Light in your level, ...the build can take quite a while to perform. So even if it only took 10 seconds, you wouldn't want to have to wait those 10 seconds every time you moved an actor in your level. Mm -hmm. So this allows you to build only when you're ready. Okay, so then after the build finishes, if I press play, the baked-in static lighting will render correctly, and I will no longer see the red warning message. All right, so that's how static lighting works. Just keep in mind that by default you'll be working with Lumen, and so you want to set your lights to move. Oh, because lighting, because we're set to, have a to do otherwise. Also keep in mind that when you're using dynamic lighting, you don't have to worry about building the light. All right, so now let's take a closer look right. at the five types of light actors and their properties. Well, Starting with the here. directional light, which is used to represent sunlight or moonlight. Mm. So I'm going to drag a directional light into my level, and with it selected, if I go over to the details panel. I can view and edit several of its properties. The first property I'm going to talk about is intensity. This controls the brightness of the light. So if I increase the intensity, the light will get brighter. And if I decrease the intensity, the light will get dimmer. The next property is the light color. By default, the color of the light is white, but you can change it, this if you want. So there are two ways to change this light color property. One way is to click on the triangle to the left of it and expand this RGB menu here. With this, I can adjust the amount of red, green, and blue in the light to determine its overall color. So if I wanted a red light, for example, I could remove all of the green and blue. Or and just give pick me a light the, the color red. picker dongle. The second way to edit this value is to click on this strip here that previews yeah. the color. This will open the color picker. The color picker is available in several places. Okay, we know what a color picker is. One from the brightness values, direct values, source, soft angle. Okay. These basically affect how soft the shadows produced by the directional light are. Oh, yeah. The higher the value, the soft Yeah, source, soft angle. Do we have it? 
Soft source radius. Yeah. I don't see anything changing. Soft source radius. Those are really nice. Uh, okay, so there's there's like an example of the the shadow right there. So if we do uh, so, uh, source length and then soft source radius, source radius, there, soft source radius fifty. There, that's kind of like the. That's it. After the edges of the shadows will be. Mm -hmm. The default value of 0.5357 for source angle is meant to represent how shadows should look in natural sunlight. And one thing you should know about these properties is that they take advantage of a new computer graphics technology called ray tracing, which is mm -hmm. only supported by the latest graphics cards. So if you haven't bought an expensive graphics card or a new gaming computer recently, mm -hmm. there's a good chance you won't see any difference by changing these properties. The next two properties relate to the temperature of the light. By default, temperature is not used, but if you want to use it, you can check the use temperature property here. And right. what temperature does is it changes the color of the light based on how hot you tell the engine that the light source is supposed to be. So if you've ever looked at the fire in a fireplace, for example, you will notice it's made up of different colors. Most of it is red, but as you go inwards, it starts to get more orange, and then you may see wisps of Best purple and blue. The bluish yeah, parts are actually the hottest parts of the fire. This may seem counterintuitive as we think of the redder colors as the warmer colors and bluer colors as cooler colors, but as it turns out, if an, object, if an object gets hot, it glows red, but if it gets really hot, it glows blue. And if it's really, really hot, it will give me a fake phone number when I ask it out. <laughs> okay, so as I decrease the temperature setting, the light will shine redder. And as I increase the value, the light will gradually get bluer. Okay, so the next property is Effects World. This simply toggles whether the light is enabled or disabled. If this is unchecked, it will be as if the light isn't even in the level. The next property is Cast Shadows, which determines if the light will cause shadows to be cast when objects block the light's path. So obviously, you would want this checked for a more realistic environment. However, shadows are somewhat processor intensive, so if you are in the need of performance savings, you might choose to uncheck this for some of the lights in your level. The next property is indirect lighting intensity. So if some of this light gets reflected off of another surface, that reflected light is called indirect lighting and can also light up objects in the level. This property will determine how much this reflected light affects the other objects it shines upon. All right, and the last property here is volumetric scattering intensity. This property applies to fog, which will be covered in the next lecture. So when light passes through fog, it will scatter in various directions. The higher the volumetric scattering intensity, the more the light will scatter. Okay, so now let's look at the point light actor. The point light actor emanates light in all directions. It has many of the same properties that the directional light has, with a few additional ones as well. One of these is the attenuation radius. This determines how far from the source the light will still affect objects in your level. In the level editor, this is represented by this blue sphere here. So the higher the attenuation radius, the larger the sphere will be, and the farther the light will extend from its source. And the lower the attenuation radius, the smaller the sphere will be, and the shorter the reach of the light will be. The next three properties are source radius, soft source radius, and source, source length. So the light from a point light will actually emanate from a single point in the level. However, let's say I had a light that was supposed to be coming from a long, thin, fluorescent bulb, and it was above a very shiny floor. If there was a reflection of the bulb in the floor, you would want it to be in the same shape as the bulb. So you can use these three properties to adjust the size and shape that the light source will appear in reflections. Okay, so now let's take a closer look at the spotlight. The spotlight is very similar to the point oh. light, except... Oh, that's what it is. So that's what it is. So if I do this... Okay, see now, uh, I need to increase the attenuation, right? See, 30,000. Wow, I have to do that a lot to, uh, there. And then let's make this floor, we're going to make the floor chrome. We could make it lava. Ooh. Now let's take a look. It's ice. Yeah, that looks good, doesn't it? And these aren't baked in, they're real time. See, that's all real time right there. The, this doesn't move, but yeah, that this this sure does. Boom. And if we had the gun, we could uh, move it around. This suddenly, yeah, it gives me all sorts of ideas for games, doesn't it? I mean, just, just messing around with the, the absolute basics of the pretty cool. 
up that instead of shining light in all directions, it shines it in a specific direction, in a cone shape. So you can see in the details panel that the spotlight has all the same properties as the point light with the addition of two more properties, the inner cone angle and the outer cone angle. So with the inner cone of the spotlight, the light will be at its brightest and will be just as bright at any spot within the inner cone. From the outer edge of the inner cone to the outer edge of the outer cone, the intensity of the light will gradually fall off to nothing. Mm -hmm. So you can use the inner cone angle and the outer cone angle to set the size of these cones and determine how much of the light is at full brightness and how much of the light is part of the gradual fall off portion. The next light is the rect light. This actor emits light in a rectangular shape. The first of its unique properties are source, source width, and source height. These are used to represent the size of the light source. Okay. For example, the next two properties, they are usually used on studio lights, and they help the director or cinematographer or whoever to make subtle adjustments to the lighting by adjusting the angle of the flaps. So you can use the barn door angle and barn door length oh. properties to emulate those kinds of effects. The next property is source texture. So you can actually apply a texture to the light, just like you would with a material, mm -hmm. and then the light will look as if it's being filtered through that texture. Mm. Alright, so finally the skylight. The first property of the skylight under the light category is real-time capture. When this is enabled, actors such as the sky atmosphere and volumetric clouds, both of which we will learn about in the next lecture, these actors will then affect the skylight. So if you're using those actors in your level, you will probably want to enable this property. Mm -hmm. Alright, so again, the skylight is used to represent the reflection of light from the atmosphere or faraway objects in the sky, such as clouds or mountaintops. And to determine at what distance this light should appear to emanate from, we need to define at what distance the sky should be considered to start at. So by default, this source type property will be SLS captured scene, which just means that the sky will be defined as any point that is the sky distance threshold away from the skylight actor. So if the skylight actor is placed at the center of the level, with a sky distance threshold of 150,000, we are saying that the sky should begin 150,000 units from the center of the level. There's also the option to change the source type to SLS specified cube map, and then provide a file called a cube map to define the area that should be considered the sky. However, cube maps are beyond the scope of this beginner's course. And yeah, we'll yeah, yeah. All right. Let's just do that really quick. Um, the sky. Okay, so now we have to get the the sky sphere. What was he doing? Is that the skylight? There it is, the skylight. And then, um, is it, yeah, it affects the world. Uh, but we have to get our directional light affecting the world again. There, now it's affecting the world. Um, but our directional light, you know, we can change it. We can turn it way down, right? And then the next is then the skylight what did he say i wanted to do something oh yeah the sky distance threshold let's bring it down to just like 500 Poof. see that really didn't change anything five five hundred thousand yeah that's not really changing anything whoa intensity scale 1.5 yeah, see, now, do you see what's going on? It's reflecting the clouds. That's what that is. That's what's going on there. Oh, cool. Actually, you can see how all of it changed. Yeah. Okay, got it. And that will do it for the lecture on lights. Okay, atmosphere and clouds is next. In this lecture, I'm going to be discussing actors that can help you add a realistic looking atmosphere and clouds to your level. So let's say I start out with a new, completely empty level. I'll add in a plane mesh for the floor, and a couple of pieces of furniture, and then I'll add a directional light actor to represent sunlight. So notice that even though I added a directional light for sunlight, it still doesn't look like we're outdoors. So I'm going to show you how to do that now. So I'm going to go up to the create menu and then down to the visual effects category and add a sky atmosphere actor to the level. All right, so now I have a blue sky and a sun. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this sunlight is actually my directional light. So if I select my directional light actor, then go over to the details panel and then go down to the atmosphere and cloud category, there will be this property atmosphere sunlight. This is set to true by default, and as long as it's true, this directional light actor will be linked with the sky atmosphere actor, and changing certain properties of the directional light will affect the sun disk of the sky atmosphere. 
So for example, if I go to the light category and I increase the source angle, it will increase the size of the sun disk. If I increase the intensity, it will increase the amount of light emanating from the sun disk. And if I were to change the rotation of the directional light, it would change the position of the sun. Yeah, I mean, essentially we already have that. We just, where's the sun? Yeah, there it is right there. There's the freaking sun. Now, if we, uh, now our skylight, yeah, the directional light. See, this is not actually the directional light because the directional light is somewhere else. But if we, there, see, it's changing what the sun looks like. And source angle, see. This doesn't change the intensity, but it changes how big the sun is. So a soft angle. Hmm. Yeah. Light shaft occlusion. There's the uh, there's the god rays right there. On this in the sky. This is because it looks at the direction that the light rays from the directional light actor are set to hit the Earth, and then calculates where in the sky the sun should be for that to make sense. So now if I switch to the rotation tool on my directional light actor and change the Y or Z angle of the light rays, it will change the location of the sun disk in the sky. All right, and there's actually a shortcut specifically for the directional light actor that makes it th this easier. If you hold down Control L while mm -hmm. nothing is selected and then move the mouse, that will also change the rotation of the directional light actor and thus move the sun around in the sky. So one cool thing about the sky atmosphere actor is that it will accurately render what the sky should look like at different times of the day. So if I set the Y rotation... Okay, uh, let's try light, that. Yeah, we need easier. to do that. If you hold down control... This is because it looks at the direction that the light rays from the... ...category, and I increase the source angle, it will... Inc ...from the sun disk. And if I were to change the rotation of the directional light, it would change... Yeah, let's change the rotation of the directional light. Let's just see if that's true. Uh, whoops, I screwed up. Yeah, see, yeah, like, like that's changing right there. Uh, in, in fact, we have the directional light on. This is the widget. Now watch, see, see. I'm changing it just from the widget. There, where is the sun now? Hey, it went away. Oh, it's behind the clouds. Okay, and then um, he said it's Control L. There, there it is. See, you can change the position of the directional light, and look how it's even changing the clouds. Look at that. It's going. It's going down. The sun is going down behind the clouds. Whoa. Elder Colvey House said, cool hug. Okay. Change the position of the sun disk in the sky. This is because it looks at the direction that the light rays from the directional light actor are set to hit the earth, and then calculates where in the sky the sun should be for that to make sense. Down green so now if I switch to the rotation tool on my directional light actor, and change the Y or Z angle of the light rays, it will change the location of the sun disk in the sky. All right, and there's actually a shortcut specifically for the directional light actor that makes this control easier. L. If you hold down control L, while nothing is selected, and then move the mouse, that will also change the rotation of the directional light actor, and thus move the sun around in the sky. So one cool thing about the sky atmosphere actor is that it will accurately render what the sky should look like at different times of the day. So if I set the Y mm -hmm. rotation of my directional light to 180, and the Z rotation to 0, the sun disk will be located Sonic on the horizon, and the sky and scene nice. will look like a sunset. Alright, so now let's take a look at some of the properties person. of the sky atmosphere actor. The first category I want to look at is the atmosphere category. So first, the atmosphere height property is pretty self-explanatory. This is the height in kilometers of the atmosphere. In other words, it is the distance from the surface of the planet to outer space. Okay, so another cool thing about the sky atmosphere Wait, do we have... Is that yeah, let's see if we have sky atmosphere. I think we do. Yeah, there we go. There's that. Now, where is the sky atmosphere? Ground radius. Now, watch. Look, look. Look at that. There's no ground. I think this is actually the planet's radius right here. 
Yeah, yeah, that is the planet's radius. Planet top at absolute world origin. Allows for a seamless transition from the ground to outer space. Oh, atmosphere right, height. So to make this demonstration not take forever, I'm going to set the yeah, atmosphere height a lot lower, down uh, to five kilometers. And then I'm going to set the camera speed and the viewport to the maximum it? speed. And then I'm going to right click on the mouse and press the E key so that the camera and the viewport starts moving straight up. And as we move higher and higher, you will start to see the curvature of the Earth. So sorry, flat earthers, but in Unreal Engine, planets are indeed round. And then as we continue to move higher, the atmosphere will gradually get thinner and thinner until it disappears completely and we reach outer space. Alright, so that's pretty cool. And if you were developing a game that includes space travel or something, this feature would really come in handy. Alright, so the next property in the atmosphere category is the multi-scattering property. This setting determines how much sunlight should appear to scatter or bounce around in the atmosphere. With this property set to the maximum of 1.0, which is the default, the effect will mimic the average amount of scattering in the Earth's atmosphere. As you set this property's value lower, this effect will lessen until it reaches a value of zero, at which point it turns off completely. Alright, so now let's go up and take a look at the planet category. The first property, transform mode, is used to define where the bounds of the planet should be considered, considered to exist relative to the location of the sky atmosphere actor. So with this set to the default value, planet top at absolute world origin, the surface of the planet, and thus the bottom of the atmosphere, will be considered to be at the world origin of the level, which is located at coordinates 000. Mm -hmm. When this value is set, moving the sky atmosphere actor has no effect on the location of the atmosphere in the level. When this is set to planet top at component transform, the surface of the planet slash bottom of the atmosphere will be considered to be at the location of the sky atmosphere actor. So in this case, moving the actor will change the location of the atmosphere in the level. When this is set to planet center at component transform, then the center of the planet, not the surface, will be considered to be at the location of the sky atmosphere actor. All right, and then the next property is the ground radius property. This property is used to define the size of the planet that your level exists on. It's the measurement in kilometers from the center of the planet to the surface of the planet. So this is used to calculate the location of the surface of the planet when the transform mode property is set to planet center. Well, this also helps to accurately calculate the curvature plane. of the planet when transitioning to and from outer space. All right, and then the last property in the planet category is ground albedo. So going back to the scattering of light in the atmosphere that I discussed earlier, some of that light is due to the reflection of the light off the surface of the planet back into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Depending on the qualities of the surface, the light will be reflected back at a certain wavelength and, th and thus color. So the ground albedo How property will determine this? the color yeah. of that light. The overall effect of all this is that the property can be used to change the color of the sky. All right, and then down uh -huh. under the atmosphere category is the atmosphere Rayleigh category. These properties deal with Rayleigh scattering, which is the scattering of light in the atmosphere due to small particles such as air molecules. So probably the most common example of Rayleigh scattering in the real world is how the sky appears redder at sunset. So blue light scatters more easily than other colors. The, the upper atmosphere is less dense, meaning it has less air molecules than the atmosphere closer to the surface. So at noon, when the sun is high in the sky, its light is traveling through the less dense air and thus less of the blue light gets scattered and more of, its, more of it gets through to the surface. At sunset, when the sun is on the horizon, its light is traveling through much denser air with more air molecules that scatter more of the blue light away. The result is that a lot more of the other colors get through relative to blue light and so the sky will look more yellow, orange, and or red which is why this looks the way it does now. Mm -hmm. And so the Rayleigh scattering scale property will like, determine how like pronounced this. this effect is. Lower values mean a less dense atmosphere and thus less light is scattered, and higher values mean a denser atmosphere and thus more light is scattered. So as I change the value, the colors of the sunset will change. And then the next property is used to set oh, the yeah? color of light that scatters the most easily. The as colors of the sunset will change the yeah, Rayleigh scattering, and this is the sky atmosphere. So the ground albedo is one thing he mentioned before. It doesn't seem to be making too much of a difference here. Ground radius. Yeah, we already looked at that once. Uh, atmosphere height. Yeah, we know that, right? scattering yeah let's see how much yeah see so doo, doo, doo. this is if there's no Rayleigh scattering but then there is right so we can make it really really uh, we can re make it really dramatic see look at that <laughs> whoops some of the lights getting through that that block and then the Rayleigh scattering itself can make machines that eat. When machines take over the planet, we gonna life underground near core cause of the warmness. Whoa. Uh, 
the reason and what this is it's which which color it's blocking out see like I could go I could go total ape shit and do this yeah look pretty cool huh oh that looks really good looks so calming ah oh. in the real world this is blue which is the default but you could change this to another color, say red, and then you would have red skies with blue sunsets. And then the final property here, the Rayleigh exponential di distribution, is just used to specify how high up in the atmosphere you have to go before the air becomes less dense. Alright, and so while Rayleigh scattering involves light scattering due to smaller particles, such as air molecules, mm -hmm. me scattering involves light scattering due to larger particles, such as dust or air pollution. In this type of scattering, light gets absorbed, calling these, causing the sky to appear hazy. So the higher you set the me scattering scale property, the hazier or foggier the atmosphere will appear. Oh. Turn it all the way up, and your level will be foggier than your brain on one of Mario's magic mushrooms. <laughs> Seriously, folks. I'm not sure I like this guy's jokes, but at least, well, at least it adds a little bit of spiciness to the... Okay, let's do the me scattering. Whoa. It's so friggy. It's way too foggy. Whoa, that's so foggy. But that wasn't really... I mean, that doesn't seem all that foggy. But look what it's doing. It's causing uh, god rays. Looks, speaking from experience, if Mario or Luigi ever offer you some mushrooms, just say no. At least, I think that was Mario and Luigi. I ran into them on a street corner downtown, so who knows. So anyway, you can use this feature to mimic the haziness of a desert during a sandstorm, or the smog of a polluted city, or just regular fog. And then there are several other properties in this category that can help you fine-tune exactly how you want it to look. Alright, and then the last category I want to look at is the Atmosphere Absorption category. So this is similar to the Rayleigh category, and basically you use the absorption scale property to set how much light gets absorbed in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and the absorption property to set which color gets absorbed the most. So this is just another way of controlling the overall color mm, of the sky. Absorption. Alright, so that's how to create an atmosphere. Now yeah. let's look at how to create clouds, Whoa. using the volumetric cloud actor. So I'm going to go to the create menu, and then visual effects, and select volumetric cloud. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the properties of this actor. Starting with the layer category, the first property is layer bottom altitude. This simply the specifies the distance from the ground in kilometers that the cloud should begin to appear. So you can see as I slide this value higher, the bottom of the clouds gets higher and higher in the sky. And as I move it lower again, mm -hmm. the clouds get closer and closer to the ground. Yeah, let's part. Let's, well, here, we have to reset these to their default values so we can actually see the dam. There they are. There's the clouds again. Now, let's, uh, yeah, let's look at those clouds. Volumetric clouds, okay. So layer bottom altitude. See, you can bring them way down. Uh, or you could go way up. Uh, the layer height. See, this is the height of the clouds. And you can add any number of layers you want. See, like I could duplicate this if I wanted. There, see, now we got two on the layer bottom altitude, and now we bring the second layer down. Hey, but there's only tracing start max distance. Hmm. Okay. The next property, layer height specifies the distance from the ground in kilometers that the clouds should stop appearing. So if I move this value higher, you can see the top of the cloud layer reaching higher and higher into the sky. Mm -hmm. And so if I set these two properties back to their default values, with the clouds starting 5 kilometers from the ground and ending 10 kilometers from the ground, the total height of the cloud layer will be 5 kilometers. Alright, and then if you look down here, you can see that this has a planet category just like the sky atmosphere actor. So you can set the planet radius in this actor as well. But keep in mind that this value will only be used if there is no sky atmosphere actor in the level. Otherwise, the value in the sky atmosphere will override whatever value is set here. All right. And then the ground albedo property for this actor determines the color used to light up the bottom of the clouds due to the light reflected back from the surface. Mm -hmm. All right. And then the next property is what really gives the volumetric cloud actor its flexibility. And that is the material property. 
so the overall look of the clouds is specified by the material that you set here. Unreal Engine includes a default material here called Simple Volumetric Cloud, but this gives you the ability to swap that material out for another one that you download or create yourself. So this allows for a wide variety of different looking clouds that can be used in your games. Okay, and then there are various properties on the Directional Light Actor that will affect how its light interacts with the Volumetric Cloud Actor. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to select my Directional Light Actor okay. and then scroll down to the Atmosphere and Cloud category. The first of these properties, Atmosphere Sunlight, we've already seen. So just like this property needs to be enabled for the light to affect the atmosphere, this must also be checked if we want the light to affect the clouds. The next property, Cast Shadow on Clouds, determines if the light from this actor should produce shadows on the clouds due to the meshes in the level. Yeah, so with this property disabled, if a plane flew between the sunlight and a cloud, you would not see the shadow of the plane on the cloud. But if this property was enabled, then you would see the shadow of the plane. The Cast Shadows on Atmosphere property is just like the previous property, except applied to the atmosphere rather than the clouds. Okay, and then the next property is Cast Cloud Shadows. So while the Cast Shadows on Clouds property determines whether or not other objects in the scene should cast shadows on the clouds, the Cast Cloud Shadows property is the reverse of this, and determines whether or not the clouds themselves should cast shadows on the other objects in the scene. Or a simpler way of thinking of this is that this property simply determines if clouds should block sunlight or not. So with this property disabled, a heavy cloud cover doesn't cause the rest Do you know this song? This is a really good song from Fallout New Vegas. There. This one, this is part of the Paula New Vegas soundtrack. One of, it's actually one of my favorite songs in all of the Fallout franchise. <laughs> she didn't say it. She didn't say it there. Don Green 47 said, Meanwhile, I'm waddling towards the exit. Yeah, yeah, it does kind of feel like that. But you know, um, I don't know where it shows up in the game. I think it plays it on the loudspeakers as you're um, sp just before, or like as you're meeting. Um, uh, what's her name? You know, the one who had the lobotomies? Can we go? I keep forgetting her name. Yeah, Christine. To let go. Begin, begin again tonight. It's a, it's a very forlorn song, isn't it? That's the best way to describe it, I guess. It's the level to look any darker. But with it enabled, as you can see, the environment does look darker, just like when the sky is overcast in real life. All right, and then the next property is the cloud scattering luminance scale. This sets the color of the light that gets reflected off the clouds. So well, basically, this can be used to, to set the color of the clouds. And finally, I want to take a quick look at the Skylight Actor again. So as discussed in the previous lecture, the Skylight Actor has this property real-time capture. When this property is enabled, the skylight will take into account right. the sky atmosphere and volumetric cloud actors when calculating how its light should render. At so if you have a skylight in your all level the time. and also a sky atmosphere and or volumetric cloud actor, you will most likely want this property enabled. Mm -hmm. Alright, so that will conclude the lecture on atmosphere and clouds. But you can totally tweak this all. You can tweak every single thing.
Okay, player start. All right, so this is going to be a quick lecture on the player start actor. Mm. So if your level does not contain a player start actor, the player will begin the level at position 000. So if you want to have control over where the player will start the level, you need to place a player start actor. The player start actor can be accessed from the create menu in the basic section of the menu. So if I drag one in my level, you will see that wherever I place it is where I will start when I press play. So if I move it into this mm -hmm. corner here, for example, that is where I will begin. The player start actor can also be used to specify the direction the player should be facing when the level starts. Mm -hmm. This light blue arrow here indicates that direction. So if I switch to the rotation widget and then rotate the actor around this way, when I start the level, I will now be facing in that new direction. Okay, I'll show you really quick what he's talking about. Hey, where's Unreal Engine? Okay, uh, we need to add one because we don't have one. Player, oh, we do have one. It's right there, player start. Okay, so player shark is over here. Uh, instead, how about let's, let's do something really sinister. This is also from Fallout New Vegas. And then there's the, see, there's the start direction. But I don't know how to access that. I don't know how to get there. Oh, yeah, player start tag, player start direction, player start instance. And I think, uh, is this what we're rotating? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. So, so now if we switch back to default player start, see, that's exactly how we start. Huh. Uh, it doesn't show up, but that's, that's how that works. Okay, this is too many windows open. All right, so if you ever place your player start actor somewhere in the level where it intersects with another object, the icon of the game controller will change to a label that says bad size. <laughs> so to make sure your player doesn't start the level stuck in the ground or in a rock or something, just move the player start actor to a position where the icon shows the controller instead. Okay, so while you are developing your levels, you will often want to test something or look at something in game right in the spot you are at in the viewport at that moment instead of wherever the player start actor might be. So you could go grab the player start actor and place it at the new location and then put it back when you're done, but there are better ways to do this. If you think it's just going to be a one-time thing and you're going to want to go back to starting from the player start location right after this, what you should do is right click in the viewport where you want to start from and then choose play from here towards the bottom of the menu. If you want to move around the viewport and continually start the level at wherever you are at that moment, you can go to the drop down menu to the right of the play button and choose to spawn player at current camera location. So now the player start actor will be temporarily disabled, allowing you to test things in your level quickly right at the location you're at in the editor. And then when you want to go back to using the player start actor, go back to the drop down menu and choose to spawn player at default player start. Alright, and that will conclude the lecture on the player start actor. Okay, that's all it was, I but but I did want to stop. I did want to find out how he repositioned the other arrow. How do you do that? Your player doesn't start the level. The actor around this way. Oh, the there, like that. Direction the player should be facing when the level starts. Yeah. This light blue arrow here indicates that direction. So if I switch to the rotation widget and then rotate the actor around oh. this way. Oh, okay. When that's, I start the level, that's all he did. And then yeah. Okay. Sorry. Got it. All right. In this lecture, I'm going to discuss components. Components are different objects or functionality that you can attach to your actors. There are many different kinds of components. Some of the types of components are objects that are also used as actors on their own. For example, this you could attach a static mesh as a component to another actor. Or you could attach a light as a component to another actor. Other components, such as movement components, do not have their own actor type and are only used as components on other actors. Mm -hmm. For example, a rotating movement component attached to an actor will cause that actor to rotate but wouldn't have much use on its own. Alright, so now I'm going to construct a crude flashlight by attaching a spotlight component to a cylindrical static mesh. So first, let me shape and scale my mesh. So now, well, I'll do this off camera, but actor. it's... Select that actor, then go over to the details panel and click on the add button. You'll get a long list of different components you can add, grouped by category. There will also be a search bar that you can use to quickly find a type of component by name. 
So I'm going to go down to the lights category and choose spotlight. And this will add a spotlight as a component of my static mesh cylinder. And you can see the component structure of your actor in this section of the details panel here. So first of all, notice that the static mesh itself is technically, is technically considered a component. So let me drag in another cylinder to demonstrate this. So this is a new cylinder mesh I just added to the level. What this is saying here is that this is an actor named Cylinder 2 that mm -hmm. has a static mesh as its root component. And that static mesh is the white cylinder. So if I go back to the flashlight I'm creating, you can see that the spotlight has been added as a subcomponent or child of the static mesh component, which is the root component for this actor. Okay, so I have my spotlight attached, but I still need to position it relative to the mesh. So if I select just the spotlight in this window here, I can use the tools in the viewport to move and rotate it. So I'm going to position it at one end of the mesh here. And then I'm going we to should probably do what he did. Um, didn't I forgot what he chose? A static mesh actor. Okay, let's just do what he's doing. I'm just curious. Okay, so here's our level here. Um, beautiful level. Uh, let's. I I think he just used this, didn't he? Or no, actually, I don't think he did. Rotating movement component components on its own are light by to a cylindrical static mesh so first let me shape and scale my no he used a static mesh let's get that off place actors um there's a shape there's the cylinder yeah so uh let's actually make this easier 30 30 degrees and then there, there's our that, and then um, let's make sure he Mesh. we're doing what he did too, which I think he just scaled. Yeah, that's all he did. That's all he did. Okay, so you scale like this, and you can scale down. Oh shit! Well, that doesn't look good. There. Well, that's too long now. Hang on. Ah, there's our flashlight. So now, when you want to attach uh, different components you can add, then... Yeah. So there's our cylinder. So now, when you want to attach a component to an actor, select that actor, right then go over to the details panel and click on the add button. Mm -hmm. You'll get a long list of different components you can add Got by it. category. There will also be a search bar then that you can use add. to quickly find a type of component by name. So I'm going to go down to the lights category and choose spotlight. Mm -hmm. And this will add a spotlight as a component of my static mesh right. cylinder. See, and you can see the exactly component structure of your actor in this section of the details panel here. So first of all, notice that the static mesh itself is technically is technically considered a component. So let me drag in another cylinder to demonstrate this. So this is a new cylinder mesh I just added to the level. Ah. What this is saying here is that this is an actor named Cylinder 2 that has a static mesh as its root component. And that static mesh is the white cylinder. So if I go back to the flashlight I'm creating, you can see that the spotlight has been added as a subcomponent or child of the static mesh component, mm -hmm. which is the root component for this actor. Okay, so I have my spotlight attached, but I still need to position it relative to the mesh. So if I select just the spotlight in this window here, I can use the tools in the viewport to move and rotate it. So I'm going to position it at one end of the mesh here. And then I'm going to rotate it so Wait that the minute. light shines for Wait a minute. I'm not getting any light. Why not visible? What? Uh, what's the problem here? Yeah, something's wrong. Okay, what did I do wrong? Static mesh cylinder, and you can you can use to quickly find a type of component by name. So I'm going to go down to the lights category and choose spotlight, and this will add a spotlight as a component of my static mesh cylinder. And you can see the component structure of your actor in this section of the details panel. I don't know what's going on. Like, it's not casting any light. Why not? Uh, this is. And then if I just... Uh, and then if I add a spotlight right here... Oh, these aren't... Oh, yes, it is working. It's just uh, not very strong. I see, I see. Ah, there we go. Are you kidding me?
exclama guión bajo remosa said, what a game is this one? Hey, what game is this one? Oh, this is, uh. Elder Colve House said, oh, we're doing Tiny Game 4. But or are you wondering enjoy. about the music? Yeah, so there's the spotlight. All right. So what was he saying? Metal here. So first of all, notice at least that. So let me drag in Metal another cylinder to demonstrate this. Said, lot of lighting and so this is a new cylinder mesh I just added to the level. What but this is saying here is that this is an actor named Cylinder Two that has a static mesh as its root component, and that static mesh is the white cylinder. So if I go back to the flashlight I'm creating, you can see that the spotlight has been added as a subcomponent or child of the static mesh component, which is the root oh, component for this mouse. actor. It's okay, so I have my spotlight attached, but I still need to position it relative to the mesh. So if I select just the spotlight in this window here, I can use the we already know that. to move and rotate it at one. I'm going to rotate it so that the light shines forward relative to the mesh. Okay, so let me delete the other lights in the level so that you can see this one better. And also, I'm going to rename this actor to flashlight. Yeah, sure. So now I have this flashlight actor. That's right generally a good idea. And if idea. I move it or rotate it, it will move or rotate the cylinder, which is a static mesh that is the root component of the actor. Yeah, let's see. And it will also move. Or yeah, let's make sure that's true, but I'm sure it is. Okay, now where's our freaking a flashlight? Now, if we rotate this, there it is. It's working. We have a f real working flashlight. We invented a flashlight. Okay, now let's also simulate physics. Can't wait. I love simulating physics, don't you? Um, bonk. There, see, now I can push it around. There, see? Oh, that's cool. See, I can push it around, and now we're... Uh, actually, let me grab the gun really quick. This, this should be fun. Hey, where's the gun? There it is. Get out of the way. Let's shoot that. Let's shoot the flashlight. <laughs> Wee! <laughs> fabulosa. IT works. Yeah, that's cute, isn't it? Okay, we can. I did not know how to do that. Now I do. Or rotate the spotlight because the spotlight is a subcomponent of the static mesh. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is an important concept to understand that the transform of an actor is based on its root component. So, for example, when an actor is rotated, all of its components will rotate around the center of the root component of the actor. All right, so from here, I could continue to add components if I wanted. So let's say I wanted a little cube mesh to represent a button on the flashlight. With the flashlight selected, I just need to click on the add button again, then select this cube mesh here. I'll rename that to button. And with just the button component selected, I will use the, view the viewport tools to scale and position it. Wait, what is he doing? All right, so now I have this button mesh as a subcomponent of the cylinder mesh as well. Okay, so what if I wanted to add a static mesh from the content browser as a component? Oh, in that case, I see. after clicking on the add button, instead of choosing one of the pre-made meshes available in the modes panel, I would just click on the generic static mesh. And this will add an empty static mesh component to my actor. Mm -hmm. But now I have the ability to choose which static mesh I want to use by using the right. static mesh section of the details panel. Right. And this will allow me to choose a mesh from the content browser. Like a button. Okay, so that's how to add static meshes or lights as components to your actors. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look now at a component that only exists as a component and not as its own actor. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to drag a cube mesh into my level. And I'm going to set its mobility to movable. Uh -huh. Then I'm going to click the add button, go down to the movement category, and select rotating movement. Yeah, 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 let's do so that. So now I've added a rotating movement component to this cube. I didn't know you could do that right in here too. So that we're actually, we're going to do that uh, rotating movement to this thing. Rotating movement, good. And then now that has become part of the flashlight. Uh, and the way that rotating movement works is that you can choose Like a default rotation. Now watch this. See, it's 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 trying to rotate itself. There we go. It's rotating. Well, it's trying to at least, isn't it? 
It's definitely trying to rotate. Here, let's help it along. Whee! Yeah, we give it a nudge on the one side and then boom. That's funny. It looks more like a cigarette than anything. What is it doing? Very weird behavior I didn't expect. And then if we do this, watch this. Oh, where's the flashlight? Uh, then you have to go down to rotating movement. Now if you do uh, uh, 200, 150, uh, 180, now it's gonna go. It's gonna go ape crap. Yeah, look at that. It's just. Go <laughs> Elder Calvey House said, "We." Okay. So anyway, my computer is heating up too. I don't think my computer likes that too much. And then it'll start banging against those cubes, and you'll see it start knocking the cubes in different directions too. Hmm. Well, actually I didn't give it much mass. Oh yeah, there it goes. Now it's knocking the cubes over. Funny. And if I press play, you can see it spinning around. Now if I use this window to select the rotating movement itself, I can edit some of the properties of the mm -hmm. component. <laughs> we so the first that. property is rotation rate which mm -hmm. specifies how much to rotate the actor and in which direction. So whatever angle you enter in one of these boxes, it will rotate the actor. Hang on, uh, hang on. I, I, this is me being goofy. I, I have to replicate this like five times. Let's just see if it'll be the war of the march of the, or the dance of the flashlights. Do you see what I'm doing here? Now watch, watch. Uh, let's do uh, how many? How many do you think my computer can handle before it breaks? Like, uh, you know what? Then we're gonna have to save this, but because I uh, I can feel it ready to crash. Yeah, eight eight flashlights. Okay, we are going to save all. Good. And here we go. Do 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 do. Oh, they're falling off the edge. Uh, that's that's tragic. And yes, they do bounce. They will collide with each other, see, and bounce off of each other. You know, keep keep this in mind. We should add this to one of our, uh, to the fire maze. Yeah, we'll add goofy stuff like this to the fire maze. Just corny, corny, dumb stuff. Okay. Dunbrain47 said... Ha ha ha, blow up your computer with pretty lights that go everywhere. <laughs> yeah, right. said, this is going in the fire maze. Degrees per second. So right now, it's only doing a yaw rotation, mm -hmm. which means rotation around okay, the axis. Okay, we already figured that out. Degrees per second. Yeah, we already know what it's talking about. Okay. Point to a different location. Uh -huh. Go 100 units pivot along the x-axis and use that location as the pivot point. Oh! So now if I press play, you can see the cube is no longer rotating around its center. It's Oh. Now, what happens if we do some something stupid like that? Hey, where's our where's our flashlights? Wait a minute. What happened to the unloaded? What do you mean unloaded? You don't unload. I didn't tell you to unload. Have you seen this before? Uh, 3D Arc? Why did it unload? Never told you to unload. I don't know. We're going to have to investigate that. Unloaded. I mean, it's here. And if I press play, I see it. There they are, but then here. Let's. Re I can't imagine why they would be unloaded. 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 Can you think of any reason? 
Oh, this fucking game engine. You know, there's so many things um, that, that don't make sense, right? Like unloaded. Well, why don't you tell me why you unloaded it? Focus actor bounds. Source control, pin, move to. Maybe uh, if we go out and back in, I don't know. Okay, so we. this is the um, test for Tiny Game 4. That's what you were just doing. Uh, let's finish what so now he has. Now around a point right about okay. here. All right, so that will conclude the lecture on components. Okay, well now we know how to, how to make components. No, lecture, I don't think so. Volumes. I don't think so. That does not sound right. I, I shouldn't have to go into project settings and check and uncheck a bunch of stuff and uh, hack the game engine just to get something to show. Seriously, so that, this this get there there. It just something weird happened. Weird. So the pivot point. Yeah, of the rotating movement. Yeah, weird. Unloaded. So you just have to like uh, reload the level then. Maybe maybe it's just like a level reload. Yeah, let's it's change the big. pivot. Oh, it's a bug? Yeah. So I would guess the way to fix that is just to reload the level, right? Oh, you know what? If you, you can't... You can't select the Best shadow killer you can't select the light working. inside each one of these. You have to do that individual or the rotating movement. You can't you can't change it if you're when it's grouped together like that. You have to do them individually. Forty seven said Ditto. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Oh wow! Look at yeah, there it goes. Wow! Holy crap! Did you see them? Yeah, it's, it was the ones. It's not that one. It's, well, actually, you can't even hardly, here. Let's put this one down at the ground, and then that would be the one. Start at current camera location. Yeah, there it goes. But then it goes flying off the edge way too quickly, so you can't even see the see it pivoting. That's funny, really, really funny. Okay, okay, now we're in volumes. Volumes. In the Unreal Engine, a volume is a 3D area of space that is invisible to the player and serves a specific purpose depending on its type. You can access a variety of volumes from the volumes category in the Create menu. So for example, there is something called a blocking volume. A blocking volume will prevent actors from being able to enter that volume. So you can use them as a type of force field, or mm -hmm. just to block off areas of your level where you don't intend for players to go. So I'm going to drag a blocking volume into my level, and then resize and position it so Elder that it covers this area here. The walls. Okay, let's put a Bethesda wall up. Uh, what was it called? Where did he find that? And then resize and there's from being able to enter that volume. Oh, I see. So you can just blocking, see, volume. There it is right there. Blocking. Oh, all one word. You can even do camera blocking volume, which could be very useful sometimes, right? Cool. Okay, now it's on the ground. Now if we try to walk into that. Oh my god, I just fell right off the edge. Now, let's try walking right into it. So you can't see it, but it's there. Oh, we can't move. Then we have to walk around it. So it's working. Okay. So you can use them as a type of force field, or just to block off areas of your level where you don't intend for players to go. So I'm going to drag a blocking volume into my level GPUs and then resize and position it Just so that kidding. it covers this area here. Mm -hmm. So now when I press play, you can see that the area I define with the volume is not accessible. It will block the player from entering that space. 
That's cool. So with my block Learning so much. I'm going to go over to the details panel and scroll yeah. down a bit and notice that there's a category called brush set, brush settings. Mm -hmm. So a volume is actually an, another type of brush. Oh. However, for the entirety of this course, I will f refer to volume brushes as simply volumes in order to avoid confusion with geometry brushes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so under brush settings, you have the same properties available as the geometry brushes. You can change the shape and size of the volume and so forth. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's look at some other volumes. So a camera blocking volume is just like a blocking volume, but is meant just to block the camera. So this is useful in third person games when you want to keep your camera confined to certain parts of your level. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the most important type of volume is the trigger volume. Trigger volumes are cool because they can be used to trigger something called an event when an actor trigger enters volume. or exits them. In the upcoming section on blueprints, I will show you how you can define a set of instructions for the engine to perform when certain events occur. So for example, if I had a haunted house in my level, I could place a trigger volume in the doorway, in, in the doorway of the entrance and I could name it player enters house volume. And then using a blueprint, I would be able to define an event and name it something like player enters house event that should fire off a set of instructions anytime the player enters the player enters house volume. And I could define those instructions to be anything I wanted, such as playing a scary sound file, or having the mesh of a bat fly around the room, or playing an all Nicolas Cage version That's of the girls just want to have fun music game. video, etc. You know, just anything really terrifying. So the end result would be that anytime the player enters that doorway, something specific happens. To give you another example, let's say I had a racing game. I could place a trigger volume at the finish line so that when the player reaches that point, it will trigger the event that handles the end of the race. So you can see there are many, many uses for trigger volumes in the world of gaming, and I will be using them more in the lectures on blueprints. So going back up to the create menu, okay, another type of volume is the pain causing stage. volume. Second a time pain causing game. volume will cause damage to an actor who enters that volume. So for example, you could surround a fire with a pain causing volume so that a player takes damage if they enter the fire. Oh really? But, but you have to have that mechanism in your game to begin with. So, for example, um, pain causing volume, pain causing volume, and here's our pain causing volume. Let's put it um, over here. But see, uh, we don't have any concept of pain in this level, so that's why nothing happens. You have to actually have pain to begin with. Uh, now, how do you get? How do you select it? Oh, like that. Damage is a built-in concept in the Unreal Engine, and you can use blueprints to define what happens when an actor takes damage, such as subtracting from their health based on the amount of damage done. So let's take a look at some of the properties of a pain causing volume. The first property is called simply pain causing, like and this will determine if the volume out. will actually apply damage to actors that enter it. So by unchecking this, it will disable the pain causing feature of the volume. The next property is damage per second, and this determines the rate at which the actor inside the volume is damaged. But note that it does not determine the interval at which the damage is applied. That is set by the pain World interval property. So for example, a with a this at one and this at one, this is saying that yeah, every one right. second, one point of damage should be applied. If the pain interval was changed to 0 0.5, then damage would be applied every half second. However, now only half a point of damage would be applied each time, so that overall, the actor is still only receiving one point of damage per second. If the pain interval was changed to 2, then damage would only be applied every 2 seconds, but it would apply 2 points of damage each time. So an, e an easy way to calculate how much damage will be applied at each interval is to multiply these two values together. So if the damage per second is 2 mm -hmm. and the pain interval is 4, we know that 8 points of damage will be applied at each interval. Okay, so the damage type allows you to change the overall way that damage by this volume is handled by the engine. However, in almost all cases, you will just want to leave this on the default, so I'm not going to go into it any further than that. And finally, entry pain. This just specifies whether or not damage should be, should be applied to the actor Stay immediately close. upon entering the volume. The With entry pain week. checked, the actor will receive damage immediately, and then again after every interval. With entry pain unchecked, the actor will not receive any damage until the first interval has elapsed. All right, There's so a reason why... Is the kill Z volume. This volume will yeah, destroy kill Z. any actor that enters it. 
So this volume is useful for defining any places in your level that mean instant death. The so reason example, he's, he introduced us to level, the pain causing the pit with volume is because we're going to be or using that to in kill this a game. And fallen off a ledge You've got the health pit, meter. You would probably want to use a kill Z volume. So let me demonstrate that now. So if I drag a kill Z volume into the level here, and I make it really wide. Let me show you what, what he means. So here's the here's a kill volume. Uh, let's, uh, uh, oh yeah, add kill volume, kill Z volume, kill Z volume. And let's put it right here. So any, so any time, so this is just a little box, but um, any time that any of these Zika uh, uh, um hit that box, it's going to, well, it'll go away. Now watch, watch, poof, there, see? Hey, but it's not working. It's not working like I expected though. Hmm. Well here, let's, uh, yeah, it's a funny thing when things don't work as you expect. And that didn't work as I expected. There, now let's see what happens. There. Hmm. -mm. Maybe I forgot something. So this is a kill Z volume. Terminal velocity, priority, fluid Jungle friction. Forty seven said, "Love these floating Z grit." Physics on contact. Um. Level here. Make it really wide. Okay, maybe we missed something here. And place it under the platform. This will cause the actor to be ine inevitably destroyed if he or she falls off the platform. So if I press play, and I fall off the edge, once I reach the kill Z volume, the actor I was controlling will be destroyed. So now I won't be able to do anything anymore. But like why? Why doesn't ours work? I have a kill Z volume right here. What did I miss here? Fluid friction kills E volume instance. Simulation generates hit. Generate overlap. I don't know what I'm doing wrong here. I did the same thing he did. Kill Z volume. Volume into the level here. And I make it really wide. And place it under the pl but it is a kill Z. It is a kill Z, so um, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Let's see what happens if we do this. Now, okay, I must just be doing it wrong. Uh, maybe, maybe, kill Z volume. Maybe, oh you son of a bitch, maybe it has to be like way down here. No. Okay, well I'm, I must be doing something wrong then. I don't know. Platform, this will crawling will be destroyed. Then from here, you can make a blueprint. This allows you to change the physics of the space within the volume. Hmm. For example, the first property here is terminal velocity. Terminal velocity is the maximum speed that something can reach when it's falling. Or put another way, the maximum speed something can reach due to the forces of gravity. Right. So when something falls, if nothing interrupts the fall, that object will continue to accelerate until it reaches the terminal velocity. And then it will no longer accelerate, it will fall at a constant rate of speed. In the real world, all objects falling towards the Earth have the same terminal velocity. But this value will be different on other planets that have different amounts of gravity. So you could use the terminal velocity property to better mimic an alien world. Or you could use it to produce other effects. Elder For example, reducing the terminal velocity of the volume to the something really low so the objects fall very slowly through it for some reason. The next property is priority. This is used when two physics volumes are overlapping to determine which volume settings should be used for that overlapping space. Mm -hmm. The higher the number, the higher the priority. So if I had a physics volume with a priority of zero, overlapping a physics volume with a priority of one, only the settings for the volume with a priority of one would be honored within the overlapping space. The next property is fluid friction. This is used to mimic the friction that occurs when something passes through something semi-solid. 
For example, trying to walk through water is a lot more difficult than walking through air because there is a lot more friction. And walking through mud is more difficult than walking through water. So the higher the fluid friction, the slower the objects will pass through it. And then finally is water volume. This specifies whether or not the space that the volume is defining is supposed to be occupied by water or a water-based liquid. Oh, so this, for example, could be used in blueprints to specify that any time the character is within a water volume, that the character should have the ability to swim. All right, and I just want, and I just want to point out that other volumes have this character movement category as well, such as the pain-causing volume and kill Z volume. But if all you needed to do is affect the physics, then you would use a physics volume. Alright, so the final volume I'm going to cover in this lecture is the post-process volume. This volume is used to tweak the rendering settings for just certain areas of the volume. Uh. Any objects within the bounds of the volume will be rendered according to the properties of the volume, mm -hmm. and thus have the current values of those properties overridden. So, for example, I mentioned in the lecture on lights that there was a way to change the global illumination method in only certain areas, mm -hmm. so that you can use static lighting in those places. A post-process volume is how that is achieved. So, to demonstrate, First, I'm going to go back to the dynamic global illumination method property in the project settings and make sure it is set back to the default lumen. And then in the level editor, I have a point light and a cube mesh within a post process volume. So I'm going to select the post process volume and scroll down until I find the global illumination property. And I'm going to set it to screen space. And now I'm going to select my point light and set its mobility to static. And now I'm going to build the lighting. So now, if I press play, whenever I'm outside the bounds of the post-process volume, the engine will use lumen, which will disregard static lighting, and I will be unable to see the cube. But once I enter the bounds of the volume, the engine will use the screen space lighting method, and I will be able to see the static lighting, and thus the cube. Interesting. Right, so that will conclude the lecture on volumes. Okay, so this is where now, here, finally, we start the game. And voila, we start building the game. Okay, here we go. Uh, and that's where, wherever it says tutorial, that's where you're actually building the game. So. All right, so this will be the first video in a series of tutorial videos in which we will create an entire sample game from scratch. So if you want, go back to lecture one to see a demonstration of the completed game. Mm -hmm. And it's said, important that you only nice. use the project you create in this lecture for the tutorial lectures. If you'd like to follow along with the editor open during the other lectures, you should make sure to have a different project open then, so you don't accidentally make unwanted changes to your tutorial project. Mm -hmm. Alright, so in this video, we will be creating a new project and a new level, and we will be constructing the sky for our level. Okay. So we're going to create the sun, a blue sky, and some clouds. Alright, so let's get started. So if you don't already have it open, start the Epic Games Launcher and then launch the engine. Yeah, that's Or if you already have the editor open, go to File, New Project. Either way, you want to get to the New Project window of the Unreal Project Browser. Mm -hmm. Okay, New Project. Uh, but we don't have to do that. We've already created it. Uh, I, I like this level. I like the way this looks. So let's just save this as it is. And then... Um, open project because they've already created it and it should be called well you can't see it here yeah remember remind me to show you the the levels okay uh sucks well actually you can just browse yeah browse tiny game four there's nothing How am I going to? I've already created it. Hang on a minute. Let's see. Tiny game three project location. Tiny game three project name. Tiny game four project name. New pro. Oh, we're going to have to create a new project. I really don't want to do that. Okay. Yeah, we'll just. Unreal Projects, Tiny Game Board. The only thing that should be in here is what we grabbed from GitHub. Yeah, I'll deal with this later. Actually, Tiny Game 4, uh, uh, Gitted. There, this is already Gitted. Okay, now I will create a new project called Tiny Game 4. You'll see what I do later. Uh, Tiny Game 4. Shadow Q set. 
and then ray tracing maximum scalable desktop he's probably going to have us do something different but it should always be scalable okay choose the blank template blueprint blank sure template options, desktop and maximum are selected and that the starter content option is checked give the project a name and i'm also going to enable ray tracing scalable it should always be scalable then click the create button and then i kind of wonder why he why he says maximum <laughs> Yeah, and I said blank, and then I get this. Elder Colvey House said, and it usually, it usually takes a while a for the idea. engine to create a new project, so don't worry if it looks like nothing is happening for a minute. Okay, so now go to File, New Level, and select Empty Level. I must have, uh, we're going to do that over again. Oh, that bugs me. That bugs the hell right out of me. Okay, so we just created uh, the wrong thing. Unreal Projects, Tiny Game 4, destroy it, and then we'll just uh, launch again. Unreal Engine. I must have pressed the wrong button. Please press the appropriate button. We're launching 5.1. We're not going to get very far tonight, I mean, because I actually can only go on for a few more minutes, but at least we got through the meet, you know, the, the, the meet and greet, like the very, very basic intro, and we learned some really fun things, uh, and I'm going to go back through all those other videos and uh, find out what else I can learn. Okay, I must have... 47 said, okay. Ray tracing scalable, uh, tiny game four. You know, I think they change in Unreal 5.1, they change the way that blank templates are created because I clearly, I asked for a blank template. You saw me do that, right? I saw it, I read it, you saw it. We all see, this is not a blank template. This is freaking Skyrim. And it gives me Skyrim without any monsters. Okay, anyway, I want to know how he got to where he is, though. New level. Boobity 504 said, hey, everyone. Hey, booby tits. Uh, he's, and then he said and empty level. Completely black, empty level. Yeah, so we're going to create a brand new level, empty level. Now we're in the same place. Then go to the create menu and click on place actors panel. We're going to be using a lot of the built-in actors in our tutorial game, so keeping this panel docked will make adding those actors easier. Okay. Okay, so now go to the visual effects category, and then drag and drop a sky atmosphere into the viewport. Mm -hmm. Now go sky to the atmosphere. lights category. Okay. Into lights, uh, sky atmosphere. Uh, wait, where did he say that? Cinematic, visual effect. there, sky atmosphere, plop. We got it, okay. And drag and drop a directional light into the viewport. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we do that, the reason that does this, see, the this sky atmosphere uses the directional light. Elder Colvey House said, ha. Okay. Use the text box at the very top of the details panel to change the name of the actor to Sunlight. Mm -hmm. Just so we know, just so we keep everything uh, uh, obvious. In the transform category, set the mobility of the light to movable. Movable. Okay, Sunlight should be movable. There we go. Okay, so now set the rotation of the light to zero, negative 70, and zero. Okay. Didn't 
change anything, but okay. What happens if I do 70? Oh yeah, that did change everything. There, 70. Negative 70. Good. Uh-huh. This will make the sun slightly off-center in the sky, similar to what you might see around 11 a.m. or 1 p.m. There it is. Really hazy. This will give objects that we add to the level a slight shadow. Now, go to the Visual Effects category of the Place Actors panel mm -hmm. and add a volumetric cloud actor to the level. This will add some realistic looking clouds to the sky. Now, go back to the Light Scout category. Stop. There are uh, cinematic visual effects and then volumetric clouds. Oh, th something is really weird. So this is set, it's like the, the sun is set too high. Sunlight intensity. Yeah. I think the default, it's just that it was set too high. And then the ground radius. Oh, look, you can even see how the radius changes. Whoa! Ha! How weird. That is really weird, though. Okay, anyway. Okay. And add a skylight to the level. Skylight this as well. will add indirect lighting to the level and make it look more realistic. Uh-huh. Yeah, we also need skylight. There we go. So we've got a bunch of stuff going on now. Skylight, sunlight. Uh, the skylight... Sunlight, volumetric cloud. I'd like to see these are just the location of the controls. Nothing else, but I'd like to have I'd like to have those all in one place. There, see, lighting needs to be rebuilt. Run console demand dump unbuilt light interactions to see what is unbuilt. So what we're doing, we're building lighting, just like he said. Okay, now, come on. And what it's doing, it's actually building the reflection captures on the clouds themselves. Um, we probably shouldn't have done this, but... Oh shit. There we go. Yeah, now we're back. Ah, uh, good. Now what does he say to do? Then, under the light category of the skylight, enable the real-time capture property. Real-time capture. Skylight, real-time capture. Okay, there we go. Real-time capture. We are now capturing everything real-time. And now it's going to ask us which, what, a level name. Let's call it uh, Fire Maze. Main. There. This will link the skylight to our sky atmosphere and volumetric cloud actors, which will improve their lighting. Mm -hmm. Alright, so now we have this nice looking sky in the top half of our level, but the bottom half is still this black void. Normally, this black area is where the landscape would go, but we're going to be constructing a plain area that will appear to be like an island floating in the sky. And I think it would be cool if it looked like this island was so high up in the air that you couldn't even see the ground below. So to achieve this effect, we need to make this black area match the rest of the sky. So there are a couple ways we could do this. We could use a sky sphere, but the sky sphere actor doesn't work well with the sky atmosphere and volumetric cloud actors. So instead, we should use an exponential height fog actor. Mm -hmm. So go to the visual effects category and then add one to the level. Exponential All height. Right, so fog. as you can see, visual effects exponential height fog. Okay, fine. Let's also put this at zero, zero, zero. Oh, it, that does make a difference. Look at that, it makes a big difference. Well, well, well. Okay. See, this has fixed the problem, and the bottom half of the level is now blue instead of black, and it looks more like we are floating high up in the sky. Mm -hmm. But this is this has also added some fog to the level, of course. 
So go over to the details panel and set the fog density to 0 0.0001. Zero, we don't want to set zero, it all the way zero. down to zero or that will change the horizon back to black. All right, so everything is good here. So let's go ahead and save this to make sure we don't lose any of our hard work. So you can either press Control Shift S or go up to the file menu and choose save all. This will prompt you to save your level. First, let's make a, let's make a proper folder to save it in. On the left side of the Save Level As window, right-click and select New Folder. Name the folder My Content. Now, at the bottom of the window, name the level Demo Level. Then press uh, Enter, or click on the Save button. Okay, and now that we've saved you our... You can do that. The way that I do it is I call it Maps. Uh, Best Shadow see. said, What my luck I want again. Oh, it's actually just, uh, it's just, uh, uh, jumping, like, catching gold stars. Uh, the real competition is the Battle Royale. Okay, so we're, hang on, Fire Maze Main and Fire Maze Built Data. So I put those in maps, typically, uh, but not, not in this, not in this one. Yeah, so we only have one, one folder, so far called starter content so I need the first thing I need is maps and now in the content we have fire maze main and fire maze built data let's move those over here good oh, 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 oh. level and have given it a name go up to the edit menu and select project settings mm -hmm. then go to maps and modes mm -hmm. On this screen, change the editor startup map and the game default map to the demo level that we just saved. Okay, good idea. Personally, I think they should do that automatically, but see, there's other levels besides just my fire maze main. That's This is what he asked us to do, and it's a, generally a good idea. Okay, there it is. This will make demo level the default level for this project, mm -hmm. and will cause it to load automatically every time we open the project. Okay, so now our level has a nice looking sky, and in the next video we will start constructing the actual plane area. Perfect. And this is where we have to end the stream. I know it's I know it's unfortunate. We just barely got started with the actual game, and now oh we're ending. But um, at least uh, we'll hit the ground running in the next uh, episode. Sunbrain 47 said, Night Calvi, fun stream. Elder Calvi House said, Okay, at least we've got it started, and we'll go really fast with the rest of the game. Okay, so um, I'm going to let me turn off my display capture so naked guys don't pop up on the screen.